Okay, most welcome to the second day of a workshop in quantum technology. And the topic of today's talk is uh, quant in quantum communication and quantum sensing. So uh, I think we have a very exciting program. I, uh, the AppSec looks very exciting. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, the talks today. Uh, I, I think I will be quite strict with time, so I'm just uh, communicating that also. And generally, for uh, I'll say uh, for for our invited speakers, uh, Nicola, I'll, I'll tell you when it, it's past thirty minutes, so so then you know there is a sort of you're in on the discussion time. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the rest, uh, for the other speakers, I tell you after fifteen minutes. So. So then, you know, you will need to wrap up. So I don't think uh, I should say anything more. Uh, Julia or Anton, did I forget anything important? Only if you want to mention, I don't know, your your University of Provenance. And your yes, university. yes, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm at Lund University in Sweden. And uh, in the VAC program, I'm... Uh, main responsible for the quantum sensing part and we have the main responsible for the quantum communica communication part here also Katja Gallo which is which is here so so we are both very excited I would say so uh, please Nicola uh, so our uh, professor Nicola Trips from Laboratoire Kassler Brussel is uh, giving an invited presentation and uh, please would uh, like to share the screen. Okay, can you see? Yes. Good, so all fine. Oh, sorry, just rearrange my windows here. Okay, so good uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for, for the invitation. It's good uh, opportunity to speak to this audience. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was asked to do a kind of a, introduction or tutorials to 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 quantum sensing so i will i will reduce it down huh? i will go to light already so it's the only thing i know and uh within this uh, yeah about 30 minutes as you said i will try yeah to it's it's not possible to to do everything it's a it's a too vast a subject so i, I pick a few experiments uh, and a few uh, theoretical con consideration to try to show some examples and uh, some concepts of what is going on uh, in this uh, quantum sensing part uh, with optics. And, and uh, sorry for the very biased thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a presentation, but uh, don't hesitate if you have a question on the way. I cannot change slide. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with a very, uh, maybe a bit uh, not uh, not a fancy slide, but so that we, we all start with the same, uh, the same idea. So I will speak about light and light uh, as you know, it's about the electromagnetic field, which uh, is multimode. And you will see for sensing, it's very important that we consider all the degrees of liberty of, of light. So for instance, if you expand the light into plane waves, you have uh, as many plane waves as available because of your space. And these plane waves, as one example, I come back to that of modes, and it is a classical part of your field. So the structure of your field. And what we always consider because we do quantum optics, are uh, one annihilation operator per mode. And I won't spend too much time on that, but I want to say uh, two things. So when you have uh, one mode, what you see is a sum of modes, and each mode is a quantum harmonic oscillator. And this you all know very well. Huh? Each quantum harmonic oscillator for light has photons, and photons is simply the energy level. So the number of photons, n, is a dagger f. And this is usually the uh, one of the most common ways to present quantum optics, even for quantum sensing. But uh, you know there's two ways to, to represent uh, this quantum harmonic oscillator, and both are important to speak about sensitivity. So if you go to the standard here, uh, harmonic oscillator, so A dagger A is energy levels, but X and P, which has often the quantity you do measure, uh, are position and momentum, and they have a very different structure. In particular, they have continuous uh, spectra. In light, you can do the same. Huh? You can take the equivalent of position and momentum. And for, for short, they are simply the real part and the imaginary part of the electromagnetic field. Uh, so they are called, I call them X and P here. Sometimes I will call them Q and P 
uh, okay, depends on the slide, sorry for that. And within these representations, there are two states I want to, to focus on. I'm really saying a few words. So the vacuum, which is a fundamental state of your quantum harmonic oscillator, and the current state, which is a displaced vacuum in phase space. So you take the vacuum and you put a mean field. And this, when you do quantum sensing, mimics very well when you have very good laser, uh, the state of the light you have. So let me focus uh, just a little bit more with uh, maybe an experimental point of view of what the current state is. And as I mentioned, the current state is really you take the fluctuation of the vacuum and you put them somewhere uh, in phase space. So which means that when you do a measurement, so this is uh, homodyne detection. So when you do interferometric measurements that is sensitive to the fluctuation of your light, so you measure, for instance, the x quadrature, but you could measure the p quadrature, and the current state you would see the same, at least as far as the noise is concerned. What you see, you see a mean value, which is linked to the mean value of your electric field, and fluctuations, which are Gaussian, and the width of this Gaussian is the width of the fundamental state of your quantum harmonic oscillator. And this is where uh, your limits come from when you do measurement with light, is because of this uh, vacuum fluctuation. Would you use vacuum or a current state? Often, I, I won't use it too much here. Huh? Often, this uh, vacuum uh, is represented by the Wigner functions, the phase space functions. Maybe there's no need I say too much details about that right now. But the, the message here is that the noise in our measurements will arise simply uh, from the vacuum fluctuations. So let's already start uh, with an example. So it's a very uh, simple example just to understand what's going on. So if you take a Max Zander interferometer. So in the Max Zander interferometer, you have light coming uh, from one port of the interferometer, and you want to measure the phase shift, which is relative on one arm compared to the other. And usually what you do is that you set your Max Zander interferometer, so this arise uh, around the pi and two phase shift. So when you do the difference, your classical signal is zero if the phase is exactly uh, pi and two. So what you should get is zero. But if you do a measurement in practice, sorry, what you get is this kind of a noisy signal, so around zero. And the noise you see, so with our actual experimental data, a very simple one, but still, the noise you see is uh, fundamentally, when you do the full calculation of your uh, Max and there, classically, huh, you find that the difference between the two intensity comes from this port of, this, of the interferometer. But this port has nothing, if the interferometer is well aligned, it has nothing beyond the fact that you have the vacuum fluctuation of the field so of the mode huh, that come in the other port of the interferometer. So when you make uh, interferometric measurements, if you use the best classical light possible, at the end of the day, what you have is a signal which is limited by the vacuum fluctuation of the empty port of your interferometer. So this is something which is uh, which has been known for, for a long time, huh, by, by caves in particular. And then if you, if you look at this article, or if you do a small calculation, you find that because of that, the smallest phase you can measure, your sensitivity, is one over twice the square root of three. And this is often called the, the shot noise limit in phase measurement. OK, so I guess I, I start slowly to be sure everybody is, is on the way. So I think most of you might, might know about that. And you might know also about this part, but still it's nice to, to recall huh, because before we want a bit more details, is that of course, uh, in quantum technologies, we are not bounded to current states. Uh, we can do a bit better. Uh, and you know that, in fact, the vacuum itself is limited by Heisenberg inequality, which acts on the phase and amplitude quadrature, but it means that we can have a squeeze state. And squeeze state, so I will not detail here how you do them experimentally, so just a, a very uh, simple consideration. Squeeze state are fluctuations which are not symmetric anymore. And so one quadrature, so for instance, here along the amplitude one, is smaller than the other one. And then if you make a measurement, so same type as before, and to make it concrete. So in this one, if I measure, um, maybe the name is not good, but anyway, this quadrature here, orthogonal to amplitude, I see excess noise, but it's still a Gaussian state. And if I measure along the amplitude quadrature, I will see a reduced noise. And this, if this happens to be the information I'm interested in, I will gain in sensitivity in my measurement. So here again, huh, this is something which is uh, very well known uh, in quantum optics. What does it mean in practice? 
is that now I have my max Zander interparameter, which is limited by vacuum fluctuations that come in the empty port. But because this is an empty port, I can put something in the empty port. I can choose. I don't have to let vacuum go in. And what uh, experimentalists do is that you construct a squeezing source. And I'm happy to answer question on that, but I didn't give the, the details. So you use nonlinear crystal to generate a vacuum squeeze state, so a deformation of the vacuum. And you insert it from the empty port of your interferometer. And because the noise you see here is directly linked to this empty port, the noise you will have will be reduced compared to the vacuum case. Without changing, what is important, and if when you do that, you don't have to change the right source, so where the energy comes from. So you have to see that in Vika's experiment, you have two important parameters. So one is the number of photons that come from the right source, and it comes here as a two square root of n. And the second, which is a noise, and which is come from the empty port. And this is a sigma, which is on top, which is a variance of the beam that come on the empty port. And when you have a squeeze light, this variance is smaller than one, and you improve your measurement beyond the standard quantum limit. Well, I guess you all know that the, the, the main, and maybe uh, I think it's still the only, uh, up to now, proper application of squeeze light uh, is for uh, gravitational wave measurement. Uh, so here I saw the, I show the example of the Virgo gravitational interferometer. It's not the first one doing, doing that, but it's a European one. So let's uh, let's defend the European uh, interferometer. So what they do, like in LIGO, so you have this, uh, you know, uh, Virgo is a Michelson interferometer. You have these two arms that is there, very long arms, uh, three kilometers, to detect gravitational waves. So it's not a Max Zander, right? it's a Michelson, but it's the same idea. You have the bright light that comes from the left. And the idea to improve this, this interferometer is to put squeeze light coming from the other port of your interferometer. So it's a bit more complicated in, uh, in Virgo than in Max Zander because the input and the output are the same thing. So you need an optical circulator here. But anyway, so you have a squeeze light source here on the left that is fed into your interferometer. And at the output, you make the, the detections. And this is a kind of experimental measurement they do. And what you see in this curve is the sensitivity of your interferometer as a function of the analysis frequency, so the frequency of your detections. The black line corresponds to the shot noise limited case, so the one with the best laser they have, and it's a lot of power. And the, the red line and the blue line corresponds to when you use squeeze light, and depending on which quadrature or the squeeze light you put. So the blue line, somehow you put the wrong one, so you have excess noise. And the red one, you put the proper quadrature, so you lock the phase in the proper way. And you gain about a factor of two in sensitivity for uh, frequency, for the high frequency part uh, of your uh, spectrum. So we could discuss more about that if you have questions. Uh, why it's a high frequency part? It's linked to the to the properties of the interferometer. And they are actually working on improving the interferometer both in the low frequency and the high frequency part uh, to go beyond the, the standard quantum. So after this uh, experimental uh, introduction, uh, I will quickly do a few uh, a few words about how to calculate and how to derive. I will in fact just give the result. I won't do to, want to do any derivation, but the actual limit of what we can do in these kinds of uh, optical experiments. So to put a, a framework, so very simple one, or what what is sensing uh, when you do optics? So when you do optics, the way uh, at least in my presentation at conceive uh, sensing is that you have a light source that is used to probe some optical system. Uh, so uh, um, it's not the light by itself. Huh? Uh, we have an optical system, a system that depends on the light that you want to probe. So for instance, it's a phase shift. It can be a, a position of a mirror. It can be an index of vibration of a medium. It can be a lot of different things. So you have the light interact with your system, which depends on the parameter. And then after you have your light that depends on the parameter. Then you make measurements. You can do one, you can do many. Huh? You can split your light in many uh, ports. So like in the Max Zander, we had two detectors. You can have many detectors. If you have uh, an image, you can have a CCD camera. And then you construct an estimator. And then there's two uh, information theory concepts which are important. And I will just give the concept. Huh? I will not go into the details. But one is a camera outbound. And the other is a 
quantum Kramer Harbor. And they are slightly different. The Kramer Harbor bound is linked to what is called the Fisher information and calculates the sensitivity of a, any estimator in this configuration. So, which means I make a measurement and using this measurement, what is the best sensitivity I can get? And then you, you write a, a formula like that that tells you that the best estimator you can do has a variance, which is one over uh, the number of square root of the number of the measurements times the Fisher information associated to this measurement. And of course, it's all about calculating the Fisher information. But then you have the quantum kramer hau bound, which is I optimize this bound over all possible measurements using all possible technologies, so classical and quantum measurements. So in a, in a quantum uh, uh, wording, it will be you optimizing among all possible POVM uh, to make your measurement. So in fact, the, the, in, if you want a take home message, the quantum kramer hau bound tells you what is the information in the beam before the measurement. And the kramer hau bound, what is information you can extract once you have made the measurement. So one is really related to the experiment, and the other is fundamental. And of course, you want to make the two together to improve uh, your measurement. So let me tell, tell you a few words about the quantum Fisher information. So this is something uh, we've been known for, for, for a while, huh, from uh, nearly the, the, the 70s. And if you read the Elstrom paper, there's a lot of things already in that. And Elstrom studied, in particular, uh, the phase measurement I've shown you at the beginning. Huh, so the Michelson of the Max Zander interferometer, and he showed that in fact, the best you can do is not the one over square root of n I've shown you before, but it's something that scales at one over n. And if you want to perform a measurement that reach the one over n sensitivity, uh, you have to use this uh, kind of a very, very exotic quantum state, which is called noon state, which is a superposition between n and zero photons in the two arms of your interferometer. And on top of it, huh, you need a, a, a quite a specific uh, POV. So this is complicated, but it tells you uh, what is the fundamental limit. So we'll just do uh, one more slide huh, about this uh, feature information limit. And then the rest of my presentation will be about, uh, we know what we can do, the one over square root of n. We know what is officially, let's say, according to quantum theory, possible to do. But yeah, the big question is, what are the hopes to do better and what can we do uh, in practice? But I want just to say a few words. And here, I'm not doing any demonstration. I'm just giving you some results so that you know what the quantum Fisher information looks like. So now the, the parameter here, sorry, is called a theta. I want to optimize the parameter theta. It can be a phase or whatever. So as I told you, uh, the quantum kramer hau bound or the quantum Fisher information, uh, they are all the same, tell you that the uh, Variance of your best estimator is one above, one above the quantum Fisher information. So optimize for all measurements possible on a given quantum state, which is called rho in this slide. Then you can do uh, three calculations. And, and again, uh, these are no demonstrations, they are just formula. If you have an arbitrary quantum state and arbitrary dependent on theta, uh, the quantum Fisher information has this uh, yeah, not very nice form on the right. Well, it is what it is. It's a complicated form to, to calculate. And you see that you need a lot of parameters from your density operator, which is very hard to, to convert. Then something which is very often considered, and that we will only consider here, is unitary evolution. And all the examples I've shown you so far is unitary evolution. There is no loss in my system. So it's just unitary change in my, in my state that depends on the parameter theta. So phase shift, displacement, all these things are unitary evolution. In that case, it's a bit simpler because uh, the, the derivative of your uh, state versus the parameter is simply the commutator with, so it's not a Hamiltonian, huh? it, but it's usually called H in the literature. So I, I, I take this, but H is a unitary evolution that leads to your uh, parameter dependence. So this is, but then this is still a complicated formula. And that's why I like, even if by strict on the application, but the pure state formula. Because the pure state formula is something very clear and that, that gives a lot of uh, insight. The pure state formula of the Fisher information tells you that the quantum Fisher information uh, for a pure state in the unitary evolution is simply the variance of your unitary evolution. 
And if you don't want to take a very naive figure that try to explain what it is, uh, imagine you have a, a quantum state uh, that depends, and, and you have two variables. So you have, if you have your unitary evolutions, you can associate a complementary variables. And so your state has some variance for H and has some variance for the complementary variable M, whatever it is. And so your evolution of your state, uh, so when you have a unitary evolutions governed by H, huh, you know, uh, it's quantum mechanics, evolution goes the other direction. And so your sensitivity is limited by the width here in this direction, which is bounded by Heisenberg inequality. So in fact, this formula is something which is similar to Heisenberg inequality, uh, but a bit more generalized associated to your uh, measurements. So it might still sound uh, slightly uh, uh, exotic, but that's a very simple example, is that if H is indeed energy. So if here you put energy, what you have here is a, is a usual time evolution of a quantum system. And you know that for light, time and phase are exactly the same thing. So if you do a unitary evolution with energy, then this is a way to model a phase change in your system. Uh, exactly that, like what you have here. So if my parameter is phase, then I can calculate this formula. And I find that for a current state, that the variance of energy is n because it's a current state. And so we find that the quantum Fisher information is for n. And remember, huh, in the slide I've shown you before, the smallest phase I could measure it was one over two square root of n. So it's exactly this formula. So the, the formula, the Max Zender interference we have seen before, in fact, reach uh, the quantum Fisher information for current state. And then you might wonder, can I do better? So here, I can also try to optimize the state that optimize my formula here. So to find that, I need to optimize the variance of my Hamiltonian. And here again is something when you think about it, which is quite simple. If you want to find a state that optimize the variance of your Hamiltonian, of your energy, well, you need to have a state whose eigenvalues are either the minimum or the maximum of your uh, Hamiltonian, because this is where the variance will be the biggest. So the, the most simple example to take is a superposition of n and zero if you are bounded by a fixed number of photons, which is n. If you take this superposition, then it's easy to calculate the variance, and you find that the variance of that is n squared. And you find the Heisenberg limit that the Elstrom uh, was giving in the, in the previous slide. So in this slide, huh, uh, there's two things to, to remember, I think, is that your quantum Fisher information, in fact, for pure case, is something quite uh, intuitive. It is a variance of the generator of your uh, transformation. So for instance, energy for phase. And then for current state, it leads directly to shot noise limit. And it allows you to find an exotic state to go, uh, to go beyond that. So let's study uh, for now a bit more this uh, noon state or n plus zero state, what can be done experimentally. So let me go back to uh, experimental uh, consideration. So how do you generate a, a noon state? Well, in fact, there's a, a quantum effect which is very well known that generates noon state is Angu-Mandel effect. So this is a, the original paper. Huh? You take a, a laser beam that generates two photons, one up and one down, and you make them interfere on the beam splitter. And what you know is that if you look at the coincidence between the two detectors, when the beam splitter is exactly in the middle, and if you look at this coincidence curve, you have no coincidence anymore. So you never have one photon on top and one photon in the bottom. So which means that when the beam splitter is in the middle, you have the two photons which are either on top or in the bottom. So this ongu mandel effect is a way to generate a noon state for n equal to two. So you get zero two plus two zero. So it's easy to generate a noon state for n equal two. It's a nightmare for n uh, bigger than two, but anyway, that's uh, already something. So people have done that experimentally. There have been quite a few experiments, but I picked this one because I think it's one of the most convincing one really for the topic of a quantum sensing with a noon state. And it's the, uh, it's not the, the year here, I think it's 2017. And what they did in the experiment is exactly what I've shown you. It's just not that easy to, to, to read if you don't know the experimental scheme, but I will say, say it very quickly. So what, what they have is that they have a nonlinear crystal here to generate the two photons. 
And the two photons have a different polarization. So you have two independent photons with different polarization. And if you rotate the polarization by 45 degrees, this is the same of having a beam splitter. So in the HV basis, you have two independent photons. If you look at the diagonal and triangular basis, you have uh, your noon states with n equal to two. And then they have a phase shift that they can vary. It's a, it's a plate where, where the phase depends on the polarization. So they can choose the phase for one polarization and not for the other one. And then they make a measurement. They have a beam splitter and two uh, photon detector. So this is a very simple uh, noon state experiment. You generate two photons, you induce a phase shift in the polarization basis, and you make a measurement. And what they see uh, is this type of things. Uh, I, I will maybe not say all the details huh, because I want to move a bit forward, but uh, what you have on top left is a statistic. Uh, so this red and blue curve is the probability to measure two photons in one detector or the other. And the orange curve is probability to measure one photon on each detector. So this is a statistic they have uh, in these two detectors here as a function of the rotation of the phase or the rotation of the of the plate of the phase. Sorry. And the below curve is the Fisher information calculated from these probabilities in a range. And in red here, you have the Fisher information for the uh, shot noise limit. And in blue, it's a bit more uh, advanced curve, taking into account all the experimental uh, specificities, losses, and so on, still for the shot noise limit case. And what you see uh, on the right, in fact, is a zoom from the left curve, but around this position here, so just below pi n2. And what you see uh, in the bottom curve, where you have the, the sensitivity, you see that for some phase, not all, uh, you have a sensitivity that goes below what you get for a shot noise limited uh, curve. So with this noon state in this two photon regime, uh, you can get an improved phase uh, compared to the, to the shot noise limit. So it's a, it's a proof of demonstration and it's a very nice one, but as you see, it's limited for two photons and the regime where you get improvement is quite uh, limited. So let's take me, uh, well, I think I won't have time to finish, but that's fine. It's good to do the, these examples. Let's, let let's me take another example Maybe I go a bit faster on this one, which is distributed sensing. And because this is for me the two, uh, the two modern things that people see, distributed sensing, it's always about phase. Huh? Distributed sensing, you, you have a phase you want to measure, but now your phase is distributed among many beams, like phi one, phi two, phi m. And what you want to measure is the average uh, of all these phase. And here again, you can calculate uh, the standard quantum limit, so what you can do with current state. And then because it's distributed, there's two other bounds you can calculate, one for separable state and one for entangled state. And the quantum resource they consider here is not noon state, but it's only a squeeze light or a Gaussian entanglement. And what you see is depending on uh, how you go, some uh, m, which is the number of measurements, or n, the number of photons, goes out of the square root. So with entangled, you have no square root anymore here, so you get a better sensitivity. With separable, you have a square root on the m, and the square, uh, standard quantum limit will have square root on the two. So what they did, they did an experiment uh, in the entangled case. Uh, so maybe I'll go directly here. So how do they generate entanglements? They take one squeeze beam, and they split it on different beam splitters. And so this is a fact, huh? I don't give the explanation, but when you take squeeze light and you split it in two, you get two entangled beams. And so they did twice, so they get four entangled beams here, four phase, they make the measurement, and they look at the sensitivity as a function of the number of photons. So it's still very weak beams. And what you have here is a standard quantum limit. What you have in blue, is the sensitivity you get if you put one squeeze beam on each phase measurement. And in red, what you get if you put only one squeeze light, but that you share and that you use uh, entanglement. And I think what we learn here is that it's a, it's a very nice uh, idea huh, that, uh, in fact, you use much less resources, only one squeeze beam, and you do better than if we are using uh, four squeeze beams. Second point, which is there, is that you don't see Eisenberg scaling here. So the scaling, which was supposed to be better 
you don't you, you see just an improvement you don't see a scaling difference and this is this is because this is very hard to to get as soon as you have a bit of losses so this eisenberg scaling is in practice in fact not reachable and the other point the last point i want to insist uh, that the supposed to be the third part of my presentation but uh, it will be uh, uh, quite short finally is that this is a single mode problem so at the end of the day even if you do many measurements you find that with one squeeze beam this is the optimal solution so using one squeeze light is much better than using many uh, and it's all about finding what is the proper mode to squeeze to improve the measurement so in the max zander interferometer you're squeezing the empty port here you squeeze this one that you split in several and you get uh, your measurement. So it took a bit uh, more time than what I thought. So I have to choose. Uh, yeah, let, let me uh, do like that. So let's let's finish on this um, on this example to show that this applies also uh, to special modes. Uh, and so this is all old stuff, huh, but I'll put it in a maybe more generic context. So with special modes, now what you want to measure is not phase, but it's position. Um, and if you want to measure the position of a Gaussian beam, a way to calculate how to do that is to say, OK, I have a Gaussian beam which is displaced, a small displacement. And what I get is a beam which is not displaced, plus the displacement times the derivative of the beam. And you see that the derivative of a 0, 0 is a 0, 1 mode. So the strategy to make a good measurement of, posi of, measure of position is to detect light in this uh, zero one mode. So how do you perform such an experiment? In practice, this is not too difficult. So let's put it in a more uh, what happened in the experiment. So you have a beam which is moving. You read formation in this zero one mode. So what you do is the interferometric measurement. So you take a strong beam which has this shape. You make it interfere because uh, zero zero and this one are orthogonal you don't see. And with this, you extract information. You're limited by the vacuum here, like in the Max Zander. And the sensitivity you get, so this is a Fisher information, not the quantum one. So what is the best you can extract? As this kind of shape, W0 is the size of your beam. And otherwise, as before, you have the noise of the empty mode and the square root of the number of it. So it's very similar uh, that the Max Zander. And this uh, is not a surprise, and it's a bit general. And maybe I'll finish my presentation on this uh, a bit more uh, theory slide. But to, to tell you that this is uh, really a general uh, consideration. So here again, it's a bit of uh, of theory, but I just give uh, the solution. I don't give the uh, the demonstrations. But as you see, huh, a beam of light with many modes. So you can write it in a very generic way. And the F here don't have to be plane waves. They can be hermit ghost modes like before, or they can be anything. And the parameter we have considered so far, in fact, are parameters that do not modify the quantum state itself, but that modify the classical part. So a phase shift change the classical phase. A displacement change the position of your classical beam. So this is what we call a modded coded parameter. So what the parameter does, it does a basis change. It's changing the shape of your modes. And in that case, you can find that the Hamiltonian that induces your transformation is simply a basis change Hamiltonian. So I don't give you the details, but please ask questions if you want. But this is the most generic basis change Hamiltonian, which is governed by a scalar product here between your mode and the derivative mode. And this is like in the slide before. What is important is how the modes depend on the parameter. So that's why these terms appear. And then if you place yourself in a case where you have a strong mean field, so you, you just, you can always do that. Huh? You say that my first mode is my tr strong mean field. So in the previous slide, it was my uh, Gaussian beam. You define the derivative mode, which is the derivative of this one versus the parameter. So it was a zero one. And in that case, you find that your Hamiltonian simplifies to a single mode problem. And, the, and this you can show properly, huh? that the only mode which is important is a derivative of your mean field. And, and I insist in this result, this is not the kramer band anymore. Huh? This is a quantum kramer band So you can show that whatever your problem, in the limit when you have an intense field, 
the only mode which is relevant is the one which is a derivative uh, of your system. And uh, you find uh, the Fisher information is now the, the variance of itself. OK, and then I just show that this is what we have done. And I will stop here because I think I'm already uh, slightly over my time. So this is what we have done experimentally. Uh, we squeeze this beam. And uh, we have shown that you could improve uh, the, the, the displacement measurement uh, with a squeeze light. So if you don't mind, I will jump to the, to the group picture uh, slide. So this one, anyway, you will see it was introduction to, to Clementine presentation. So we'll see later on in present Clementine presentations. But I still need to show the, the group picture and to show the people that participated to that. And if you don't mind a, a message uh, for this kind of thing, but we have for the position available. I thought I would still stick to, to, to this message. OK, and for this, I'm happy to, to answer two questions. Thank you very much for that uh, pedagogical presentation, I would say. So it's open for questions. I guess you can raise your hand in, in the um, on the reactions if you would like to ask something. Let me know. I don't see any hands, but you can also, since there's not a competition, if you want to ask, you can just unmute and unmute and ask a question. Yeah, yeah, go go, go for it, please, um, directly. Okay, I I will jump with one question uh, at least. Uh, um, so. Um, uh, you showed some data from uh, Ulrike Andersen's lab yep. in, in, in Denmark, and you had this uh, poor photon entangled state. Um, so I, I was just curious. So how, I, I guess, I, I guess it, it's, it's an experimental question. <laughs> yeah. I'm an experimentalist, but, but have you, I, I mean, how how good is that entanglement? Have you any idea how how, how well that this works? That these schemes. So, so this one here. Yes, exactly. So, so let me know if I exactly answer your questions. But if you look at entanglement itself, so the quality of the entanglement you have here after the the three bin splitter mm -hmm. is not very good because you use a single squeeze light. So in fact. I had this kind of uh, generic slide. Huh? If you want to do uh, a good entanglement, so you have a many port uh, interferometer, but you need how many squeeze light as port interferometer. So if you look here, indeed, you can have vacuums that come here, here, and here, and here. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that in this experiment, because what you want to measure in the mean of all this phase, so when you calculate your estimator, the noise of all the empty ports just goes away. Mm -hmm. And, and this is related to, to my last slide, that at the end of the day, when you do the linear combinations, this interferometer is sensitive only for, from the light that comes from here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's why I try to say that, in fact, at the end of the day, this is a one squeeze light experiment. So it's similar to the Max Zander. It's just the configuration is a bit more complicated, but you have to yeah. identify where you put your squeeze light. Yeah. But as far as entanglement is concerned, it's not a very good entanglement, that's for sure. OK. Uh, yes, Julia? Yeah, I thank you, Nicola, for the nice talk. Um, I So OK, you presented uh, uh, some slides where you show that you can use these uh, different uh, spatial modes to detect the uh, uh, shifts of the position of the beam. But um, I also know that you work on uh, uh, frequency modes. And uh, I was wondering if uh, they can be used or you are going to use them or somebody else uh, is using them for measuring time then, I guess, because I imagine that that would be the uh, variable that one would use with frequency modes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so thank you, Julia. So you can do, indeed, the exact equivalent to this experiment with uh, optical pulses. So if you consider that in, instead of having a beam, you have a, a Gaussian pulse, and you want to measure indeed time or phase, huh, because then you have a, the time and so time of flight or phase, these are similar things. Indeed, uh, your information 
is in the derivative mode. So it's in a, in a pulse, which has the shape of a zero one mode. And uh, Christine Siberhorn has done an experiment uh, on that in the single photon regime. And we looked at that a bit in the, in the CV regime and we've done a few things, uh, but you can do and it exactly the same, uh, it's exactly the same approach. And, uh, and then, uh, so something I didn't mention uh, because I, I realized I was a bit short on time, but what people do now, which is more fancy and we do in the time domain, in the spatial domain, so which Clementine will speak about, is instead of measuring the position of one source, we try to measure the, the distance between two sources. And this you can do same in the spatial domain, as Clementine will say, as Christine did the same uh, with optical pulses. So these two domains, uh, it's exactly the same equation. So you can do the same. Of course, technically, it's a bit harder in, in the pulse regime to, to extract, to separate the modes. And in the group of Christine, they use their uh, pulse uh, optical, uh, what they call pulse gate to extract the mode, but it's a bit complicated. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll thank uh, ah. Nicola Treps thank again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Oh, I need to free the stage. Yes, yes. thank yes. you. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess my pronunciation is not so good, but Shiren Wang. Yes. Yep. From Université Paris Clay Institute and Institute Quantique Sherbrooke, Quebec. I guess you may be visited in Paris or or yeah, right now I'm in Paris. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So the uh, title of the talk is Electron Spin Resonance with Single Spin Addressability. Yeah. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this talk. And I'm a co-supervised PhD from these two institutes. And today I'm going to talk about uh, electron spin resonance uh, with single spin addressability. So finally, recently we have reached this goal uh, with our uh, ex this experiments. I want to explain what's happening in this, this experiment. So this is outline of my talk. I'll begin with motivation. And then I will talk about how we detect the spins and control spins. And then I will show you the experimental results in frequency domain and time domain. Okay, motivation. What motivates us to study these tiny objects that you can find almost in every piece of material? One big application is for characterizing matter. For example, in material science, um, this method allows us to identify the species of the spins inside the crystal and also their interaction in the environment and also the concentration of the spins. And this is important for understanding the material properties. And also the same method can be applied to chemistry and biology to study the molecular structures, for example. There are already industrial equipments to do this, ESR experiment, but they rely on the uh, ensemble of spins. And what we want to do is to push the sensitivity to single spin. And another application is for quantum information. For example, if we can reduce the sensitivity to single spin, to control a single spin, we can do it in the manner of a qubit. And also we can, through the spin, we can start its nuclear spin environment. Also we can even control the nuclear spin and use this electron spin as a quantum sensor. In both cases, talking to individual spin, which means control and readout is very important. So the spin system we work with is a shellite crystal or calcium tungstate, and there are many impurities inside. And we are interested in an erbium. The reason is uh, actually the reason is that uh, rare earth ions has uh, a very uh, good. Uh, in our case, it has high general magnetic ratio that can increase sensitivity. But what I want to stress is. Um, our approach is more universal. It can detect other rare earth ions or other impur uh, impurities, uh, the paramagnetic species, for example. And in this crystal, uh, we have a very pure crystal grow by our collaborator, Philippe Cotner, and it is undoped. And the erbium inside this crystal are residual dopants. So at a very low concentration, you can see it's about one ppb. The erbium replaced the calcium site. So the detection method is that even if the uh, erbium is, has very complicated electronic structure, but uh, it, at millikelvin temperature and microwave range, it can be regarded as uh, elect effective spin one half. So you can treat it as just electron under some magnetic field. And we have this Zeeman splitting effect. It can absorb microwave frequency 
absorb microwave at a certain frequency. So what we do is uh, we put a superconducting resonator, which is the LC circuit uh, along this inductor Y and oscillating field is generated and inductively coupled to the spins inside the crystal. We send the microwave to excite the spins to its excited state then the spin will relax back to its ground state by emitting photons. Then with a single microwave photon detector, we detect these photons and we get information from the spins. And in practice, for sure, there's not only one spin inside the crystal, there are more spins, it's an ensemble. And each one of them has a slightly different transition frequencies due to the local electro and magnetic environment. At the end, we have this inhomogeneous broadened spectrum so in our experiment, what we want to do is to use this photon counting method to measure this spectrum and do some time domain measurement. And this detector is a key point to allow this experiment. And there are two previous PhD, another PhD in our lab, they are working on this with this new version of photon detector. And finally, we reach single spin detection. So how does it work? Uh, it's based on superconducting circuits Today, I don't have time to explain the details of each component, but I can give you a flavor of it. The instant photons just come into the chip and the chip will send out a stream of clicks or just one and zero. And the principle is based on this. We convert a single photon, incoming photon into an excitation of a transform qubit on the chip. And so that of the readout of the qubit, if the qubit is in uh, excited state, we say the one photon arrived, there's a click. And on the other case, no click. Um, so there's some figure of merits I want to talk about here. When no photon arrive in the circuit, there's still some clicks produced by this chip. We call this dark count. In our case, the dark count rate is about 100 per second. And this set the noise level for us. Basically, our detection sensitivity is determined by this. If we send some input power, you can see more clicks arrive. So each bar represents a click and we can get the efficiency of the detector is about 45%. And this allows us to do single spin detection. So how do we uh, do it exactly? Uh, you already see this uh, LC circuit is fabricated on top of the calcium town state crystal. And this type, uh, this bow tie design can reach a low impedance resonator, which means the impedance of this type of resonator is smaller than uh, 50 ohm. This can enhance the magnetic field around the wire because we want to inductively couple to the spins. And the two things I want to say here, one thing is that this crystal, the specialty about this crystal is this general magnetic ratio, it is anisotropic. And the electron G factor uh, depends on the direction of the magnetic, magnetic field. For example, if we apply the field along the crystal C axis and along the A and the B axis, uh, the coupling is stronger than free electron. Free electron, you remember it, it is two. So we can also convert this uh, G factor to a general mag magnetic ratio in the unit of gigahertz. And we can calculate uh, the coupling constant based on our design that you can see. Uh, Within a depth of one micron, the coupling constant is between one kilohertz and six, gigahertz, six kilohertz. Sorry. Okay. To implement this device, uh, we fabricate uh, the niobium resonator, 20 nanometers thick, on the crystal. Let me start clear for you to recognize those components. So I help you a bit with this uh, blue box. That those two boxes are the antenna or the pads used to couple to the uh, electric field inside a 3D cavity for driving. And on the left and the right are the interdigitated capacitor. And in the middle, it is an inductive wire used to couple the spins. And in this uh, SEM image, you can see the wire is about uh, 600 nanometers wide and 94 microns long. So then we need low temperature. We could assemble to uh, 10 millikelvin. And the photon detector is all put here and the spin is uh, down to at the bottom of the setup. And we can install a magnet. We have the control over three orthogonal axes with this magnet. And the chip of the sample is put into a 3D cavity to drive. So what we can do is first, we want to measure the resonator. We send a signal from the input in the indirect in the circuit and the output signal going this way. Also the photons emitted by spins 
will go this way to reach the detector. We can see the, from this reflection measurement, the resonator has a frequency of 7.3 gigahertz and the total line weight or loss around 500 kilohertz. It is roughly in the critical copper regime. And then we can start to apply some magnetic field. Once we bring the field, we can tune the transition frequency of spins in resonance with the resonator. And based on the, this general magnetic ratio along the C-axis, and we know the frequency and we know this uh, the gamma, then we can calculate it for erbium where expecting it appears at 420 uh, millitesla. So how do we exactly do photon counting for spectroscopy? It's very simple. We, first, we apply a pulse to send the spin to excited state. Then we wait, the spin relax. And this photon counter is working in a cyclic manner. And each cycle has a time about 13 microseconds. And what happens in the real life after the pulse at the random time, we detect a click. And we can also see another click. So it can come from the spins or come from the dark on the background noise. And then we, we repeat this sequence and repeat the older cycles over and over again. We can see a next run. And again, like this, we can see more, more than two clicks. At the end, we'll just do some uh, primary school math. We sum up all the clicks. We can calculate the total counts. And once we choose a time beam, we know the count rate in each beam. Now you can see uh, clearly some, the reduction of the count rate as when the time is long. Then we can do some integration, I choose a window, and then we get the clicks. So then we can start to sweep the magnetic field around this point to see what's happening. And this is the result. We can see the total clicks or total counts has a, shows a function of the magnetic field. So the, at the, here is the, the hoping spin ensemble line. So there are many contributions. You can see the 90 counts. And you clearly see the fluorescence decay of the spins. And when we, when we look at the tail of this curve, then we barely see the background. Although we only see the background, but barely the spin signals. And then we want to go from high power to low power um, so that we can address less spins um, because the magnetic field is, depends um, on the distance. So in, when we reduce the power, we, address, we can address spins nearby the wire, about 200, 300 nanometers. And this is the result of the low power spectroscopy that you can see the peaks reduced from 90 to 0 0.6. And each peaks here, individual peaks correspond to a single spin that we can give a label to them. And when we look at the fluorescence, you can see, for example, the spin zero, we can clearly see this exponential decay. And if we take an average of uh, uh, this region between two peaks, then we can see the background noise, which is the dark count. Okay, then we can do a two-dimensional spectroscopy to see the rotation pattern, because what I showed before is an ensemble, but what happens if we do ro rotate the magnetic field be not, and then we're recording the behavior of each single spin peak that you can see they rotate. And this is the fact of the gyro, uh, anisotropic gyro magnetic ratio of the spin. And you can see that for each individual spin, because of its own local environment, this uh, uh, gamma tensor is different. That's why we see they move in a different way. Now we want to do some time result measurement. And basically all of this. The good thing about uh, a photon counting method is that we get the T1 for free because we're measuring fluorescence. But at first time when you think about this, how to measure Rabi, for example, it's not evident. But if I tell you, we can translate the count rate into a sigma Z component, then it's very clear that we can measure all of this. We just read out this component of matrix at the end. So for Rabi oscillation, we simply uh, uh, change the Ruby duration, the pulse duration, and we do the same thing as before, that we can see the uh, integrated access counts is oscillating. And here that we uh, access counts, which means we have uh, removed the background because we know the background or dark count is quite stable. And one information for you is that you can see the contrast between the ground state and excited state, it's about 0 0.1 count. 
and uh, the individual spin, eventually it will emit one photon and 0.1, this is kind of a self uh, constant, consistent uh, method to tell us that uh, the total efficiency in the whole detection chain is about 10%. And we can change the pulse amplitude to see how the Rabi frequency changes. Yeah, and we can see the frequency is linear dependent on the pulse amplitude. And this show you the what we see here is a true Rabi oscillation, not something else. Yeah, and it is interesting to characterize the coherence time of the spin. We can use a two pi over two pulse to measure the Ramsey coherence time. And from the decay of the envelope, we can see the T2 star of the spin is about 0.17 uh, millisecond. And we can use a more complicated sequence to increase the coherence time to see what we can reach. For example, the echo sequence, we add a pi pulse in between the two pi, pi over two sequence, pi over two pulses, and we can uh, get the T2 coherence time about two milliseconds, and even more complicated sequence, the the dynamical decoupling sequence with three pulses in between, and it reaches three milliseconds. And now you can see we are limited by the relaxation time of the system. And, and it is roughly about two T1 in this case. So the final thing I want to show you is that to give you a proof, this is indeed really a single spin, then we need to do a photon intensity correlation measurements. What we do is, um, the sequence is quite similar to what, what has been done before. We just keep repeating for a large amount of, uh, large amount of times to ensure we have enough statistics. Then we can calculate the correlation. For if the one spin uh, emit a photon, is, uh, in the, the photon arrives in the first bin, uh, it will not emit again. So in the second bin, uh, we are expecting to be zero and vice versa. So if we take the correlation within the one sequence between the first and second bin, we're expecting a correlation is to equals to zero. But here we see it's not zero, it's 0 0.9 because of the dark counts. That event is independent. They arrive uh, all the time. If we take the correlation between the two different sequences, for example, the first bin and the second bin and the second sequence, there's no correlation. You clearly see it's uh, equals to one. So, but we know very well our dark count, we can do some background subtraction. And this gives us a background corrected G2. And after this, we can see the, at zero, the G2 is below 0 0.5. This proves that uh, the things we are detecting is a single micro photon source, and which means it is a single spin. So to summarize my talk, we have achieved single spin detection and we can perform a QB-like experiment to it's the same way as a, what we do with spin, but with a new method, which is photon counting, micro photon counting. And in the future, what we can do is to study the statistics because in the rotation pattern, we see they behave quite differently and also we can study the coherence times on the spins. And moreover, we can also study the nuclear spin bus through the spin we have detected. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for some really nice data, I think. Um, so the talk is open for questions, please. Yes. Uh, Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, so, do you have a sense of uh, what exactly what is the macroscopic like origin of those electron spins? And do you have a sense of, for example, their density or their geometry? Maybe this is what you mean by studying statistics on spins. Statistics is that uh, the uh, basically. It's... Well, what I mean is, for example, the coherence time, uh, it has uh, certain distributions. Because from our experiment, we have measured the Ramsey coherence time between uh, 10 microsecond to uh, 500 microsecond. We can study it to see if there's some dependence uh, of this on the, for example, the location where the spin is located. And... OK, yeah, thanks. Very nice talk.
I'd like to ask about uh, you. You mentioned you mentioned an efficient detection efficiency of forty five percent, and also an overall efficiency of ten percent. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what what was the forty five referring to again, and, and yeah. what were the other? This forty five is uh, we characterize the detector separately without the spin. So we just send photons. We know that we can calibrate the photon flux. We get forty five percent. But once you install everything in the experiment, and there's a cavity or resonator used to control the spins, and it is critical coupled. So mm -hmm. basically, when the spin uh, photons leaking out of the cavity, we lose half. And also the loss on the transmission line, and the cables and circulators, all the electronic mm -hmm. components, then at the end, we get this 10%. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly the the literature here, but it seems very high to me. I mean, the efficiency that you have. Uh, you mean the photon detector itself, or? Yes, I would say both. In fact. Uh, yes, it's it's high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, the, it's uh, so the, this detector is based on the uh, four wave mixing process to uh, convert photons to uh, transmitting excitation in the superconducting circuits. Mm -hmm. and so this conversion efficiency it determines uh, uh, the total efficiency of the mm -hmm. detector. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the bandwidth, for example, the also plays a role of the detector. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I think that looked to looked very good data to me. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for a very interesting presentation again. And uh, we'll uh, have the next speaker. So, which is Dr. Varshali Adia, uh, and at this time at KTH in Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. So, uh, we are excited to hear what you would like to tell us. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Can everyone hear me and see my slides? I think it looks fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Vaishali and I'm a researcher in Professor Kategal's group at KTH. And today I'd like to present some of the quantum upgrades made to the LIGO gravitational wave detector specifically. And I think this is quite timely because the next observing run for the gravitational wave detectors is scheduled to begin in less than a month. But that being said, the other detectors around the world are not sitting and twiddling their thumbs, but the European um, Virgo detector and the Japanese Kagura detector have also performed similar upgrades to um, enhance their quantum noise limited sensitivity. And if you want to know what that really means, then stick around for the rest of my talk. Um, so why do we care? Can I hope the slides are progressing, and if not, just please speak up. <laughs> Um, so why do we care about the upgrades made to LIGO? Um, sure, the direct experimental detection of gravitational waves has opened up a whole new window to study stellar objects like black holes, neutron stars, supernovae. But if you look at the instrument itself, I find it absolutely fascinating um, because you're looking at quantum mechanical effects on such a macroscopic scale because these suspended LIGO mirrors are about 40 kilograms in weight. So experiments like these, um, along with unlocking mysteries of the universe, result in technological development, which can be used for other experiments. Um, some examples are like a development of ultra stable narrow lines of lasers or squeeze light for um, sensing and communication experiments as well. And so what this slide is trying to show is some of the pictures from um, experiments around the world that work with optomechanics, um, ranging from photonic crystal fibers to micro cavities, guided wave sources um, and also, so this is all an increasing order of mass. And here you find LIGO test masses, which are these 40 kilogram beautiful objects. So you may have seen some papers about the various observing runs of the gravitational wave detectors, which is essentially uh, the hands off time from making any major upgrades to the detectors themselves. And they perform uninterrupted coincident data taking at this, at that, during these runs. So the previous runs have led to an increased number of detections um, as the runs have been going on. Um, and they've shown mergers of black holes of various sizes, neutron stars, um, unexpected neutron star, black hole mergers as well. And this is just a pictorial way of seeing why these upgrades are important because with each upgrade, the sensitivity and range of the detectors has improved significantly. 
So the first two observing runs together yielded about 11 detections, but the quantum upgrade that was made to the detectors in the third observing run gave a total of 56 detections. So this is a five times increase in the detection rate. So hopefully you can be convinced now that the quantum enhanced sensing is really, really important. Now, what should we expect from the detectors? I know I've put down a spoiler alert here, and you may have also had this from Nicholas talk, um, that they're um, expecting to do frequency dependent squeezing. But what does that really mean? Um, and if quantum enhancement has already applied, has been applied during the third observing run, um, where non-classical light or squeezed vacuum states were injected into the interferometer, what has been done now for increasing the sensitivity for the upcoming observing run? Um, being an experimentalist, I cannot resist but show these really lovely pictures. And this is what a scaled down um, LIGO layout looks like. So you have a stabilized laser beam that enters a modified Michelson interferometer. And the effect of the passing gravitation wave is detected at the output of the interferometer where you have destructive interference. And there's a few other optical cavities that are used to enhance the total laser power injected into the interferometer. Um, and also um, the um, increasing the gravitational wave signal strength, which is done in the signal recycling cavity. If you have any questions about the functionality of these cavities themselves, um, feel free to ask me and I'll be happy to elaborate. What we're also looking for is um, something of a plot like this. And so if you've seen this before, you already know what it is, but if you haven't, you see a mix of um, measured, so in these dots and modeled um, in these solid lines, and uh, the displacement noise sensitivity plotted for one of the LIGO detectors. I myself am very partial to the LIGO Hanford detector and you can ask me all about that as well if you like. Um, but I'd like you to focus your attention on this solid purple line, which says quantum. Um, and what each of these lines is telling us is it's just the noise to signal ratio for the various noise sources in the interferometer that are cal calibrated to gravitational wave strength. So you'll see this sort of a plot throughout my talk as this is a really great way to quantify the improved sensitivity of the detectors. So if you look at that quantum um, so sensitivity curve, it was largely dominating. Um, so this quantum shock noise dominates a large part of the spectrum from um, about 100 Hertz onwards. And this limits the precision with which you can measure the minute displacement of the interferometer arms. The part that's raising up is the radiation pressure. And this arises from the photons impinging on the suspended mirrors. And you can already see from here um, that you can reduce the shock noise by increasing the laser power, but then you're making the radiation pressure effects worse. So once one can of course argue that um, you could make the suspended mirrors heavier, of course, but then you'd have to re-engineer the suspensions. So it becomes a bit of a trade-off. And the origin of both of these noise sources is um, connected to the quantum mechanical nature of the light that's being used to do this interferometry. And that brings us to this um, revolutionary paper um, written by Colton Caves, which uh, Nicola mentioned as well. So I'm not gonna go into details about this, but because you've already seen this um, ball and stick representation of um, uh, vacuum fluctuations and also a coherent state where you can see the uncertainty in amplitude and phase, uh, which is what Heisenberg's um, relation governs. Um, and just to let you know, during the third observing run, um, the LIGO and Virgo detectors were limited by this quantum phase noise from about 100 Hertz onwards. And I guess another way to think about this particular noise is that it comes from the discrete nature of light and the statistical uncertainty um, from the photon counting that's performed by the detectors. So there's a seems like a fairly straightforward problem to solve, right? You could increase the laser power, but then it leads to other challenges like thermal distortions of the laser beam, control system challenges, parametric instabilities, and so on. But one can get rid of radiation pressure, like I said earlier, by making the test masses heavier, but then that leads to challenges with suspension control and design. But there is another really neat way to fight quantum noise. Um, one can tune the signal recycling cavity that I was talking about, but this leads to changes, uh, challenges again in terms of um, control system design. But the other way, the other really neat way to do this would be to inject um, squeeze light, which is my favorite way to do this. So if you can buy for now um, 
this idea that um, you can generate these squeeze states of light using this um, component called the squeezer, and you can reduce um, the uncertainty in only phase and amplitude at um, one given time. So the heart of a squeeze light source is a nonlinear crystal. And when this nonlinear crystal is pumped by a certain wavelength, if it makes it easier, we'll call this um, green light that you see here, um, the 532 nanometer laser beam, because that's what is used in LIGO. And upon interaction with the nonlinear crystal by a virtue of optical parametric um, oscillation, it is converted to two lower energy entangled photons, and, and at, in this case at 1064 nanometers. And this whole effect is enhanced by putting um, this nonlinear crystal in an optical cavity. And now this whole contraption is the squeezer. And a lot of um, care and modeling is done before the cavity is built to make sure that it's stable, produces high squeezing factors, um, and so on. And these cavities can either be linear, like the one I've shown here, or a bow tie, and I'll show you one of those very soon as well. And both of these designs have their own advantages and disadvantages, and we can also get into that if you have questions about that. And just to let you know, the LIGO squeezer is a bow tie cavity, and the Virgo one is a linear cavity. And going back to this picture that I showed you first, where is the squeezing injected into the interferometer? It's injected via this um, Faraday isolator in, into the interferometer from um, also, because I really love pictures, and um, this one was taken by my colleague at Canberra. It's just a beautiful picture of one of the squeezers I used to work with um, in Australia. And what this picture is trying to show you here is that the pump, the green that you see, uh, with the uncorrelated vacuum fluctuations that come into the squeezer, and you have squeezing in reflection of the cavity in this case. The squeezer, however, is ju not just one optical cavity, but it needs a lot of um, smaller components that need to work together to produce high fidelity squeezing. So for example, in this Virgo squeezer that you see here, um, the first laser beam of the 1064 nanometer beam is sent into a cavity with the nonlinear crystal to produce second harmonic at 532 nanometers. And that's used to pump the linear squeezer to produce squeezing, which is then injected into the interferometer. All these other components that you see, including the second laser, um, is used for aligning um, the various beams into various cavities, controlling the polarization and the angle of the squeeze states, um, and to characterize the squeeze states before sending them into the interferometer. And if you reduce that whole schematic, these are the main components um, of your squeezer. And I'll show you, and for the third observing run, it was just um, these main components that produced phase squeeze states that were injected into the interferometer and improved the sensitivity of the LIGO detectors. And that's what you see here in green um, compared to the case where you don't have squeezing in, which is shown in black. Now, surely that should have made the radiation pressure effects worse, right? And yes, you would be right in thinking that, and these sensitivity curves are showing exactly that. So with, um, while the high frequency squeezing improved, you could see that the low frequency bits degraded. Now it's not always clear to see this effect at the really low frequencies because um, at some low frequencies, the interferometers are dominated by control noise, which arises from the multiple feedback loops that are present. But this is being worked on as well for the next observing one, and you'll see something really exciting very soon. So the target that was set for this observing run, which is going to start, um, is uh, was to have frequency dependent squeezing. And that involved a lot of infrastructure change as well. And how do you get that? I'll get to that in just a second. So along with this mystical frequency dependent squeezing, some changes were made to the squeezer cavity itself um, uh, to increase the escape efficiency of the squeezer. Um, there were also um, active mode matching um, actuators added to uh, improve the mode matching between the squeezer and the interferometer. Um, and some low loss Faraday isolators were developed in the collaboration um, and I have pictures of all these so you can see what these look like and how they're different from standard components that you see. Um, and this, this was in the squeezing injection path because you want to reduce as much noise as possible, um, as much loss as possible when you're injecting the squeezing into the interferometer as well. Now for frequency dependent squeezing. If you want broadband improvement in sensitivity, you need to be able to rotate the squeeze states at the crossover point between the photon counting noise and radiation pressure effects. 
So Kimball et al. in um, 2001 uh, proposed a really neat way to do this. So they said, we know how to use optical cavities and we know when we reflect light off of a cavity, the cavity induces a phase shift as a function of frequency um, as given by the line width of the cavity. So by engineering the properties of this optical cavity, so making it overcoupled um, and choosing the half line width or the half width, half maximum that matches the optomechanical rotation of the inaprometa and for LIGO, this is about 100 hertz. And um, you can get frequency dependent rotation of the squeeze states. And just so you know what, what scales we're talking about, this cavity is a really high finesse cavity which has round trip losses of about 50 ppm roughly. So now if you go back to this schematic and um, before you inject the squeeze light into the interferometer, you're reflecting it off of this cavity. And what does that look like if you compare it back to the um, interferometer picture that I had shown you earlier? Um, so you have your squeezing um, here coming from this OPO um, and in the frequency independent case, it was injected directly into the interferometer. Now in the frequency dependent case, you, you reflect it off of this filter cavity, which is a 300 meter long optical cavity that's along the uh, long one of the arms. Um, so you can see this in a bit more detail here, and this is how the beam is directed. And these are the, this is the picture of the infrastructure on its own. Um, this is the infrastructure as in the beam tube. Um, this is a picture of the active mode matching mirror. Um, this, if you squint really hard, you can see the squeeze light source, which is also in vacuum in Virgo, um, and then, uh, sorry, in LIGO, and in Virgo, it's outside the vacuum on the low. And this is the low loss Faraday isolator that I was talking about. Um, this picture is very uh, simplified and it doesn't show any of the controls infrastructure that you need to control the optical path length of the filter cavity. It's detuning to make sure that um, you have the right rotation frequency and so on. But does that really work? Yes, which is great, um, just in time for the observing run. So here is the sensitivity of the two LIGO detectors and you have frequency dependent squeezing shown in red and um, frequency independent squeezing shown in blue. And um, you can see that you have a broadband improvement in sensitivity, which is great. Um, and also shown here at the bottom is the total optical power in the arm cavities of the interferometers. So they will end the um, infrared squeezing levels that you have in the detectors right now. Soon there's going to be a paper on this, so um, stay tuned for that. And here's some of the photos of all the people who did all the hard work of the installation of all this new infrastructure, the squeezer, the filter cavity. Um, and so this should hopefully give you an idea of what it's like to be on the site as well. Um, but that being said, squeezing is not being used only for gravitational wave detection, but is also being implemented into several sensing communication and um, computation experiments around the world. And so just to give you an idea here, some recent papers that are looking at um, squeezing um, and some of these um, folk are actually people who worked on the initial squeeze light sources that led up to the development of the one that's implemented in LIGO right now. Um, and the direction which all this work is going is to implement similar infrastructure on use, by using waveguides and photonic systems to increase the efficiency and bandwidth of squeezing and also reduce the complications from, that arise from having optical cavities to do this work. And this is sort of one of the things I do at KTH now. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that um, the one use of squeeze light that I've shown you today is not the only one. And if you have any questions, I'd love to try and answer them. Thank you very much, Vaishali. It's, uh, it's an impressive system, obviously, and it will be quite exciting to see what it happens with a new sensitivity. So please, questions. If there is nothing else coming up, I don't see anything. So, so, so then I ask you uh, 
the question you sort of hinted that we could ask, what about the difference between the linear and the bow tie cavity? I mean, in their in their squeezing, because actually I don't know the answer, so I'm a bit quick curious. Um, so with the bow tie configuration, um, you have a lot more backscatter isolation, um, just because mm -hmm. of the yes. input path not overlapping yes. with the output path. But with the linear configuration, you will need an additional Faraday isolator to get the same level of isolation. And yeah. that's why the TU detectors decided to go slightly different ways. Um, but they all seem to be converging. And the, the problem with having these two isolators though um, is now you have slightly more susceptibility to loss. So the Virgo detectors are also considering um, potentially thinking about having a bow tie cavity as well. Mm. Mm. But there are other schemes um, where people are looking at intracavity squeezing. So if you were to put a squeeze light source inside the interferometer, um, then you would of course have a linear squeezer at the end of it. So I, I, I have no personal pre preference. I love both, <laughs> mm. but it just depends on what your application would be. Mm. Any additional questions? Then we'll continue. Thanks a lot, Marshali. Thank you. So, uh, Dementil Juvier, probably, well, uh, so we are back at uh, Laboratoire Castler Bruxelles in Paris. Yeah, hello. And, um, So, are you sharing your screen, or did you unshare, Shali? Um, it says I did. Yes. But... Are you the... sharing, Clementine? Uh, okay. No, I'm sorry. I... Ah, okay. No, it's fine. Okay. Um... Okay, do you see it well? Yes, we see yeah? it well. Okay, perfect. Thank now you. you're in presentation mode. Ah, okay, sorry. Please. Uh, no, so, no that was fine. Oh, it was fine? Yeah, it was fine. Okay, okay, cool. Great. Okay. Hello, thank you for the introduction. So I'm a third year PhD student in Laboratoire Kessler Bruxelles. I'm working in the Nicolas Treb's group. And uh, so this talk is a follow-up from Nicolas' presentation where I will uh, talk to you about some recent experimental results on source separation estimation. Uh, so the problem we are interested in, uh, I'm sorry, it appears that I cannot change slides. Uh, I'm really sorry about this. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, so the problem we are interested in can be explained, can be described in a very simple way. So we are uh, looking at two point sources that are imaged with an optical system. And as you know, because of the diffraction, uh, you will see on the screen not two distinguished uh, points, but uh, two blurry spots. And uh, this problem is uh, interesting for both uh, astronomy, for example, or passive microscopy, because if these two point sources are too close to, to each other, you cannot distinguish if there are two, source, two sources or only one. Um, this problem is very uh, old. And for instance, uh, Rayleigh has established a criterion to say that under a certain separation, uh, you cannot resolve between two, uh, two sources. The thing is, this criterion is a very visual one, and uh, it would be interesting to look at a more signal-to-noise ratio uh, description. And um, the question that we want to answer is, what is the ultimate sensitivity limit? And more practically, how can we reach it? Um, so to answer this question, actually, the quantum metrology community uh, looked at this problem. 
a few years ago. Um, and I want to underline that uh, in the parameter estimation formalism, the assumption is that everything is known except for the parameter that we want to estimate. So here, this is the separation between our two sources. Um, so to have an idea of what would be the, um, the optimal uh, experimental uh, procedure, I would like to compare between uh, two techniques, the most traditional one, that is direct imaging. So we just um, imaged the two sources on a CCD camera and we looked at uh, the spatial repartition of the intensity on the pixels. And uh, one technique that is called spatial mode demultiplexing, where instead of decomposing the light over the pixels of the camera, we are decomposing over the Helmet Gaussian mode basis. And we do that using a spatial mode demultiplexer that is called uh, the MPLC. Uh, and uh, what it's uh, actually an interferometric method and at the output uh, of the device, we have uh, single mode fibers uh, in which intensities uh, are proportional to the overlap between the input modes and uh, the amid Gaussian modes. Um, so the, the tool that is used is in quantum metrology to um, to uh, study the sensitivity of uh, measurements is the, um, the quantum fi the Fisher information, as Nicola said. So in blue here, you have the quantum Fisher information for the separation estimation. And uh, in orange, you can see uh, the chromer bound, the Fisher information for direct imaging. And uh, we can this graph actually shows exactly what we observe experimentally, that is for large separation, we can uh, measure the separation very easily. But when we go to a very small separation, the Fisher information vanishes to zero, and this is the really curse. Um, then what's happening for spatial mode demultiplexing? Well, uh, if we measure in an infinite number of modes, actually, we completely saturate the quantum Fisher information. That means that this measurement is uh, optimal for estimating the separation between two sources. Uh, well, here we are only interested in uh, small separations. So actually, what we are going to do is not measure a lot of modes, but only a few of them, and especially uh, the zero one mode, and it corresponds to the green curve. So this measurement is still optimal for small separation and is doing uh, really better than direct imaging. Um, so. This is what we are implementing in the lab. We are doing a proof of principle experiment that we can uh, actually estimate the separation between, um, between two incoherent sources uh, with a very good sensitivity using special mode demultiplexing. So we have uh, three parts mainly. The part where we generate incoherent sources from a continuous wave laser. To do that, we are using phase modulator. And when implementing the phase modulation, we see that uh, the interferences uh, pattern uh, disappears. And then we are measuring uh, the intensity at, at the outputs of the MPLC. So we are measuring in a few modes of the Amid Gaussian mode basis. And we have also a part that is a reference part. So we are using the position of each um, of each source, we are measuring the position uh, using a quadrant detector, and this is uh, our actually our reference measurement. Uh, so this is what it looks like in the in the lab. This is a very small and uh, compact experiment, and I want to show you the results uh, that we obtained uh, in two regimes. So we first looked at what's happening uh, in a high flux regime, so with an incident light that is approximately 100 microwatts. And uh, for each measurement, we have uh, three stages. So first, we align the two sources. So to assess a good, um, a good accuracy of the measurement, we have to align uh, and mod match the two sources identically uh, with respect to the MPLC. Then we calibrate the, um, the setup using only one source. And because we have ident identical uh, alignment, we can infer the calibration with two sources from this uh, measurement. 
And then we fix a given separation for the two sources and we can uh, estimate the separation using uh, the, statist the statistics in the intensity of the zero one mode. Um, so now I will show you the results that we obtained. So um, first we are using a beam, uh, a beam waste that is one millimeter with integration time of five milliseconds. And uh, we are uh, performing statistics uh, over a uh, total measurement time that is one second. So this is uh, the kind of results that we can have. Uh, you see a plot of the reference of the estimation as a function of the reference separation. So here it was for a separation of about 20 microns. And what we did is, what we did is that we displaced uh, the one of the two source by about uh, 250 nanometers. And we can see that uh, we have a clear linear um, behavior of our, um, for our setup uh, with a sensitivity that is about 100 nanometers. We perform this for several uh, separations and we, uh, est we determine the sensitivity for each separation. So this is what we see on this plot with the quantum color bound being the dashed line, the dashed gray line, so about uh, four point, uh, 0 0.4 nanometer. The orange line is the, uh, the, the chroma bound for ideal direct imaging like, uh, that we show for comparison. And uh, you can see also the sensitivity for special mode demultiplexing uh, when we have detection noise. And you can see that our experimental points uh, fall well uh, onto this line, which means that we are very limited here by uh, the noise from the detectors. And uh, but still, we can we can perform a very high uh, sensitivity since it is of the order of twenty nanometers. So we can still gain uh, a bit uh, when using less noisy detector. And uh, this is the aim, like to go closer and closer to the quantum chroma band. And uh, this is something that is uh, sorry that is possible when uh, using when performing the experiment in a low flux regime. So here, the incident light was about uh, five femtowatts. So we replaced uh, the standard photodiode by avalanche photodiode, but we performed the experiment exactly the same way. And uh, here we have again uh, the estimation as a function of the reference separation. So because of the low flux, we are in another range of separation. So about uh, 400 and 800 uh, sorry, you cannot see 800 uh, micrometers. And uh, thanks to the lower sensitivity, so here it's uh, about 30 micrometers, we can get a very nice uh, accuracy. So just want to, under, to emphasize that here we measure a very few photons, so about uh, 3,000 uh, per measurement time in total, which means that in the zero one mode, we only have two, uh, 200 photons. And here again, we can plot the sensitivity as a function of the separation uh, with the green line being the quantum chroma bound and the orange line, uh, again, the ideal direct imaging. So this orange line corresponds uh, to a very um, perfect scenario where the pixels are infinitely small and uh, there is no losses and no noise in the camera. And here, we achieve to get points that goes below this uh, very optimistic scenario. Uh, so, uh, so a better performance than the, the actual, uh, direct imaging. So I will just conclude and say that uh, in the lab, so what we are doing is performing a proof of principle experiments uh, using uh, special mode demultiplexing with a photo detection uh, for separation estimation. Uh, we achieve to get a sensitivity that is up to five orders of magnitude with respect to the beam size with uh, off-the-shelf experiments and very, uh, very compact setup. And also this uh, technique is very fast because we are only limited uh, by the speed of the, of the photodiodes of the, of the photodetectors that we are using. Uh, so applications uh, from this experiment would be like uh, all imaging, um, all imaging uh, problems and microscopy and astronomy in, uh, 
in, uh, in particular, and we are very uh, enthusiastic about our results and we have a lot of uh, other directions that we would like to explore, for example, improving the estimation using an optimal estimator, uh, also uh, min um, minimizing the noise of the detectors and um, minimizing also uh, the crosstalks that are also limiting the sensitivity. We would also like to study what's happening when we have partial coherence between the two sources, uh, look at multi-parameter estimation, for example, estimating the separation as well as the relative power, or also adding more sources. And also, uh, we would like to look at uh, hypothesis testing problems, like, like for example, um, determining if there is only one or n sources uh, in the object plane. So with that, I leave you with the same group picture as Nicola and some uh, recent publications on, of the group in the, in the, the quantum metrology uh, problems. Uh, thank you very much, and I will gladly answer any question. Thank you very much, Clementine. Uh, for the questions, I just want to say that uh, we'll uh, try just before the break to take a screenshot uh, so everyone then can turn on the camera and uh, and then those that will can take a screenshot. Uh, but we'll start with the questions. So please, questions to Clementine. Can I maybe ask one <laughs> to Clementine? I'm curious, uh, how do you see um, um, it scaling or do you see any challenges in going to smaller beam sizes? Uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> the scaling is not, uh, it's not an obvious thing. Uh, I think the most important challenges would be the mechanical noises. Uh, of course, like here, we have beams that are very big, <laughs> one millimeter. So <laughs> the mechanical noises are very like super small compared to that. And probably we'll have problems with that if we go to very smaller beams. Thank you. <laughs> and beautiful talk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Katja. <laughs> Any other questions? So I actually, uh, I, I lost concentration for a while. Could you say again, what was the reason to look at these three different spatial modes? How, what was the key, what's the key gain with that? Well, uh, the gain is that mainly we are only looking at modes uh, that are that have the information actually on the on the separation, mm -hmm. and uh, we can easily well we are supposed to see that in Nicola. Yeah, Nicola yes. <laughs> yes. This was time. related to what what Nicola mentioned. Yeah, yeah. and uh, actually, when you do when we have incoherent sources, it's like having the displacement of two sources. And when mm. you do the Taylor expansion of uh, one displaced mm. source, you see that you can decompose that over mm. the mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's exactly cool. analog to that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so uh, if you would unshare, then I'll ask everyone to, um, Activate the cameras. Um, seems to be still some cameras which are not activated. Okay, I'll 
put something. That's at least some, but this should be more, I guess. Okay, um, we'll have a break. And um, we'll be back at four for the last three speakers. Uh, starting with Yuxin Wang. So uh, see you at uh, four o'clock. Bye for now. Uh -huh.
Por él, Hold. This is a bit Okay, I think it's four o'clock and I see you look like you are ready with him. So the first speaker here in the, uh, for the last hour, uh, during the last hour session is uh, Yuxin Wan from uh, Chicago University. So one of OSC's uh, participants and uh, we will talk about quantum quenches for enhancing qubit, qubit based noise spectroscopy. So we are looking forward to that. Please share the screen. Yes, let me. Uh, so, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers for putting together this really nice workshop. Uh, so my name is Yu Xin Wang. I'm a graduate student in the group of Ash Clerk at the University of Chicago. Today, I'd like to tell you about our recent work on a new, uh, sorry, let me, yeah, on a new quantum sensing modality making use of accidental but often inadvertent quantum quenches that arise in standard defacing type quantum noise spectroscopy experiments. Uh, know that our use of the term quantum sensing is probably in a very different context compared to the other talks uh, today. Uh, so I'm a theorist. Uh, our original theory proposal was published in this paper about two years ago. More recently, in collaboration with the Gali and Ashram groups at Chicago, we also show that this general mechanism can lead to an accurate characterization tool of nuclear spin bus polarizations for single nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. So in the second part of my talk, I will also briefly discuss those results, but more details about the experiment can be found this, in this preprint. 
Uh, so to motivate our works, the general problem that we'd like to address is how to understand the properties of a noisy environment that could interact with and decohere our qubits. Uh, as shown in numerous previous works, such an understanding can really help us design better, better quantum control uh, sequences, which can in turn improve qubit coherence and gate fidelities. It also provides a powerful sensing tool, making use of the extreme sensitivity of qubit coherence to its environmental noise, so that just by measuring how the qubit decohere when coupled to different form of noise environment, we can really use that information to back out properties of the uh, environment or the bus. Uh, know that throughout my talk, I will use the term bus and environment interchangeably, which uh, they can refer to a source of unwanted noise, but it could also uh, correspond to uh, some uh, interesting quantum system that we would like to probe. So in my talk, I will focus on the sensing aspect. And the question that we like to address is, can we use those uh, standard readily available defacing based quantum sensing protocol to also probe the response properties of a quantum bus? Uh, I will explain what each of these terms mean in a few slides. Uh, but before I tell you about our results, to make sure that we are all on the same page, let me start by introducing the standard paradigm, which is given by the so-called qubit noise spectroscopy. So for the purpose of my talk, I will focus on the case where the qubit bus interaction takes a so-called pure defacing form, which basically means that the qubit frequency can fluctuate in time due to its coupling to some uh, environmental noise source, uh, which is denoted by the C of T here. And it could describe a classical noise process, but it could also correspond to an operator of a non-trivial quantum system. Uh, I would also like to note that our approach is still general and in principle applicable to more general form of noise processes. So to characterize the properties of those environmental fluctuations, what we can do is to perform standard noise spectroscopy experiments, uh, where we can measure the defacing of the qubit in the presence of such a noise process, as well as a set of generic or specifically designed dynamical decoupling pulse sequences uh, which is our, also touched on in a previous talk today. Uh, here is an example of those uh, type of pulse sequences. Uh, so the key for doing noise spectroscopy is to realize that in this case, uh, the decoherence of the qubit, it's really encodes information about a time filtered or equivalently a frequency filtered noise process. Uh, and for the typical case where the qubit is coupled to a stationary Gaussian uh, uh, environment, uh, we can really explicitly write out the coherence function of the qubit, in other words, the off-diagonal element of its density matrix in this equation here. Uh, note that this f of omega function, it is also known as a filter function, it only depends on the details of the control power sequence that we apply to the qubit, whereas this s of omega function is the standard noise spectral density function, it basically in, uh, describes the amount of uh, fluctuations in the bus mode per frequency range. So what this equation tells us is that just by measuring qubit defacing corresponding to a set of different control power sequences, we can really use this equation and the measurement result to reconstruct this standard bus noise, noise spectral density function, which allows a characterization of the environmental properties. Uh, now this uh, approach is large, uh, largely successful and has been demonstrated in really a wide variety of different experimental systems. However, there are a number of caveats. For example, the noise could be non-Gaussian and even non-classical. We have come up with a Keldish field theory based approach to really characterize those more general type of noise sources. For those interested, please check out our paper on this topic. For the talk today, I'd like to focus on the scenario where the bus could actually correspond to a quantum physical system, which means that it cannot be dynamical or equivalently, it cannot react to external perturbations. So the question we ask again is, can we use still standard defacing type uh, noise spectroscopy experiments to now probe the dynamical properties of a quantum bus? Uh, now, a naive idea one can imagine doing is to actually introduce an external kick uh, more formally uh, described by a sudden change in the bus Hamiltonian, also known as a quantum quench. In this case, just by measuring the, uh, de again, the defacing of the qubit with or without this external quench, and then compare the results, 
uh, we can again use those uh, noise spectroscopy type of experiments to uh, back out actually the how the bus response to uh, external perturbations. Uh, so what we find rather surprisingly is that the qubit itself can actually act as this kick. More specifically, back action effects from the qubit could influence bus properties. And by the end of my talk, I hope to convince you that those back action effects actually provide a really useful sensing tool. But let me first uh, explain what exactly we mean by the back action effect from the qubit. So for that, let's uh, look at the total qubit bus system quantum mechanically so that we can write the total system Hamiltonian in terms of the bus Hamiltonians conditioned on the qubit being either the up or the down state. Typically, we're interested in the difference between these two conditional bus Hamiltonians, which really correspond to the noise operators as that is coupled to the qubit. As I mentioned, fluctuations in this operator will uh, lead to qubit defacing. However, if we take a step back and look at the total Hamiltonian, we'll see that apart from this noise term, we also have a remaining term, which is given by this average between those two bus Hamiltonians. Uh, now, well, our approach is really general and in principle applicable to really generic initial bus states. So uh, for concreteness, I will focus on a typical scenario where at the beginning of the sensing protocol, we actually initialize the qubit in one of its two eigenstates, say the down state. As a result, the bus will relax to a steady state defined with respect to this HB down. Now, if we compare this HB down with uh, this average uh, bus Hamiltonian, the latter determines how the bus evolved during the sensing protocol, we will see that because of the presence of this qubit, the bus actually undergoes a sudden change in its Hamiltonian, actually known, also known as a quench at the beginning of the sensing protocol. By comparing this HB down that determines the initial bus state uh, with this average bus Hamiltonian, we can also explicitly compute the quench term. In this case, it is actually proportional to the noise operator. So that in the weak qubit bus coupling limit, this quench really corresponds to a very tiny change in the bus Hamiltonian. Uh, so, but what we find rather interestingly is that even this tiny change in the bus Hamiltonian can also have a measurable effect on qubit dynamics. So how do we understand the effects of the quench on the qubit? Uh, let, let us go to the interaction picture defined with respect to the HB down so that the quench uh, will manifest as a time dependent term acting on uh, that change the bus Hamiltonian. Because of the quench, the average of the bus noise field operator, which is given by the this C of T here, it also sees a small change uh, over, uh, over time. Now we at the level of the linear response, we can actually compute uh, this change in the average bus noise field, uh, which can be written in terms of the standard linear response susceptibility of the bus, also known as the retarded Green's function. Now, because of the qubit bus coupling, uh, this small change in the average of the bus noise field also induces a time-dependent shift, a frequency shift on the qubit. So that if we integrate this frequency shift over time, we will see that uh, the net effect of this quench term uh, during the sensing protocol is given by an additional quench-induced phase shift uh, on the qubit. We can also explicitly uh, derive the uh, quench-induced phase shift and show that it is directly connected to the imaginary part of this linear response susceptibility function. Note also that this uh, phase shift, quench phase shift also depends on this f of omega function, which only depends on the details of the qubit control pulses. Uh, what this means is that, again, by comp uh, choosing the different uh, qubit control pulse sequence and uh, in this case, measure the quench-induced phase shift effect. We can use this formula to actually back out, uh, in this case, the response uh, properties of the bus. I would also like to note that uh, this linear response susceptibility, it really provides a new a characterization of the bus properties, which is really distinct from the standard noise spectral densities. To see that, we can look at a specific example, which is given by the standard spin boson model, where our qubit is linearly coupled to a collection of harmonic oscillators. In the interaction picture, the uh, bus operator really oscillates at frequency omega of k, which is the bus mode frequency. Uh, so for this specific example, we can actually analytically compute 
uh, the linear response susceptibility function uh, and show that this imaginary part of the chi function is given by an average of the number of bus modes coupled to the qubit uh, per frequency range, which is also weighted by the qubit bus coupling uh, strength. Uh, this function is also known as the density of this function uh, of the bus. But we can also compute the noise spectral density function as of omega and show that it is actually uh, related to the imaginary part of chi via this excitation number uh, of the bus mode in each of the uh, frequency at each of the frequency. So what this tells us is that in general, uh, just by choosing the different excitation numbers, uh, we can really independently tune the noise spectral density and the density of this function, which is indeed what uh, would generally happen in a generic experimental uh, system. On the other hand, if we know that the bus is actually in a thermal equilibrium at temperature T, uh, this uh, ex uh, excitation number will be given by the standard both Einstein thermal factor. So now that I have shown you that indeed this quench induced phase shift, it really encodes information about the response properties of the bus. Let me tell you about uh, an example where we can actually measure this phase shift in a realistic system. Uh, so the quantum sensors that we uh, we pick uh, is actually correspond to nitrogen vacancy, single nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond with the corresponding environment given by its surrounding carbon-13 nuclear spins. So why are we interested in this system? Uh, well, the biggest reason, which is also a practical one, is that the NV center provides a really robust quantum sensor, uh, which uh, we can uh, people have demonstrated initialization, readout, and microwave control even at room temperature. So for this system, the total uh, we can really rewrite the total uh, Hamiltonian as this form uh, in the presence of an external magnetic field that is parallel to the NV axis because of a large uh, frequency separation between the NV transition frequency and the Lamar frequency of the nuclear spins. Uh, we can we can show that the NV nuclear spin interaction uh, can really be described by this kind of pure defacing type interaction to a very well uh, 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 to, to a very good approximation. Also note that the nuclear spins in, in principle they can interact with each other, but in the regime that we're interested in, this term is negligible. Uh, so uh, at this point, an important question to consider is when can we really treat those nuclear spins as a bus? Because by the end of the day, it really consists of like randomly distributed uh, but individual and discrete spins. Uh, we can actually show that uh, in the time scales that we are interested in, as long as there are no strongly coupled nuclear spins, let's say within half, uh, between half to one nanometer radius of the NV center, uh, indeed the effects from those individual, the net effects from each of those nuclear spins can really be viewed as a result of the coupling to a Gaussian bus. And another in interesting thing to note is that because our experiment is actually operating at room temperature, the nuclear spin has already relaxed to uh, a thermal state, in fact, at this infinite temperature or equivalent to a maximally mixed state. In this case, you, if you think about the physics or if you write, write down the uh, density matrix operator, one can easily convince yourself that uh, in this case, we do not actually expect any non-zero dynamical effect. So this system has been studied in a, a lot in previous works, but even if uh, um, uh, previous works have not looked at this spaceship, but even if they did, uh, like one would not really expect any non-trivial phase shift effect. So what we need to do is to first cool or polarize the bus spins, uh, which uh, can actually be done using standard dynamical nuclear spin polarization protocols. So after we polarize the nuclear spins, either parallel or anti-parallel to the NV center. Yeah, I see that I'm running out of time, yeah. so I will try to <laughs> run up, uh, okay, uh, very quickly. Uh, so Good. after we, yeah, uh, we polarize this, uh, those nuclear spins, we can also, uh, just for simplicity, we can perform standard Hanako measurements. And uh, here are the results. And the, the solid lines are the quantum phase shift uh, like predictions. The dashed line are full quantum mechanical simulation. So the upshot is that if we perform like the standard Hanako where we only see the dephasing of the NV, uh, 
regardless of the new Caspian polarization, we would expect, uh, and we uh, do see a same signal. However, if we measure the NV phase shift, uh, indeed we see this like non-trivial phase shift effect. And in uh, also it provides an accurate uh, kind of quant uh, quantitative uh, like uh, characterization of the actual spin mass polarization. So because I'm running out of time, let me just quickly summarize. I will not go through these uh, points in detail, but I just like to quickly note that this approach is really general and in principle applicable to also non-Gaussian bands, as well as other noise uh, source sources. We're also considering like uh, possible experimental implementation also in different kind of quantum systems, such as superconducting circuits. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge my uh, my collaborators from the Gali and Ashram groups at Chicago, uh, who really contributed to the experimental work as well as uh, some ongoing noise spectroscopy uh, uh, projects. I would also like to thank my advisor, Professor Ash Clark. And with that, uh, uh, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Yes, these questions. I think we have really good talks, but we are not so good at the discussion part. So um, I would encourage questions. So I don't see any. I would like to ask about something on, on slide 17. OK. Oh, well. That's a uh, so you have an equation there. Uh, you have the phase uh, at the end, where, mm -hmm. where which depends on the imaginary part of of the uh, of psi. So, uh, I mean, but if so, the, the effect of the real part would that be like a T one process then, or, or or that's something completely different, or or Oh yeah, uh, that's a great question. So uh, there are maybe two things that I kind of swept under the rug. Uh, but since you asked, is thanks for the question. Uh, so like if in principle the real part and the imaginary part of the linear response susceptibility actually in principle not independent, they're related by the like relation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's kind of a very complicated like kind of frequency convolution. So what actually happens here is. Um, uh, like as you can see, so we can really write the contribution, like and can specifically relate that to the imaginary part of chi, and more importantly, is written as like a simple frequency overlap. So there's no con convolution involved, and the reason why we can do this is uh, actually because uh, of assumption that we made about the control power sequence. More specifically, uh, this uh, actually is only valid. Sorry, I didn't mention this, it's, um, but it's actually important. It's only valid if we're applying those kind of echo pulse sequences. Mm -hmm. So there are not like, if you think about the average of like those f of t in time, like the zeros moment, there are no non-zero zeros moment. Uh, so in other words, if we actually look at a Ramsey, then mm -hmm. there will be some non-trivial effect from that. And of course you can really rewrite that in terms of the imaginary chi, but that will involve some like con uh, complicated convolution. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of, yeah, uh, but uh, one can really show that as long as we are performing like uh, typical dynamical decoupling sequences, indeed uh, we can actually simplify the expression uh, a little bit. So that is easier for doing those kind of uh, no special be like uh, kind of reconstruction. Yeah, hope that no, answers your no, question. Very interesting. I have a, one more question. Please. Uh, so yeah. it's about when at the end you mentioned the non-Gaussian uh, bass. Mm -hmm. So can you say a bit more about uh, what kind of a bass is Gaussian and non-Gaussian? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes. Uh, it, and it, it's a really great question. So. Uh, you can think of that as uh, so basically Gaussian bands are it, it correspond to the kind of noise processes that uh, kind of follow central limit theorem or yeah, other words like uh, you can really fully characterize the properties of those fluctuations just by knowing the second order moments or the variances or is like fluctuations. Whereas the non-Gaussian mass, it uh, is like any generic like noise processes such as like telegraph noise. Um, so what uh, what is more complicated uh, in those uh, general cases is that uh, like you also need to know 
in some sense, the higher moments to be able to characterize the noise processes. Okay. So what, yeah, uh, does that help? Yeah, yes. thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, I think we should uh, continue. Yeah. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, we are returning to Europe, um, to Jan Agusti. Yeah, yeah, probably yeah. didn't pronounce that very well, but uh, it's probably nice, John. <laughs> okay, so okay. do I just share my screen? Yes. Yeah. So, programmable distribution of multi qubit entanglement in dual rail waveguide. Yeah, so That's do you ready. all see my screen? I see, yes, we hear you well right. and we so see far? your screen. Yeah, okay. Um, so, should I just start? Yes, please. Okay, uh, so hi, my name is Juan. I am a PhD student uh, with Professor Peter Ravel at the Walter Meister Institute, Munich, Germany. And so today I want to talk about some published and unpublished work on basically how to connect or basically entangle physically separated qubits in a, in a network under realistic or even like also idealistic um, scenarios. Uh, so first, a bit of context. So we have seen throughout this workshop um, some applications and some protocols performed on a, with a few qubits, but then when one actually thinks about it, and for probably it requires much more uh, number of qubits, or even thousands. So one natural question to ask is: Is it even feasible to just stack all the qubits inside the in the single place? And to circumvent all the technical difficulties, there has been um, a lot of research into what's called basically uh, and a modular a modular uh, approach so basically the idea is so is instead of relying on a single let's say computational unit to perform your protocol you just go modular so basically you just distribute your protocol throughout the nodes of your network and you just rely on the individual components among it and usually the backbone of these protocols is the basically the interconnectivity between the different nodes or in other words whether we are able to entangle the different nodes in the in the network, and to entangle different nodes uh, physically separated, there has been a lot of amazing experimental results. Uh, so here, um, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, so um, there are some results from ETHAC, for example, where here what they do so they generate a a, a, a qubit uh, photon pair. Then the idea is basically they propagate. The, the the photon throughout this physical link and under certain conditions it's absorbed to uh, by another qubit here and basically effectively you just create an entangled pair um, on, on, on this network um, one of the problems here is that you really have to work on, uh, on minimizing the losses because so in these protocols if you have more than 50 percent of losses um, it's not possible to create an, uh, an entangled state between the between the two nodes <clears throat> there has also been a lot of progress on a sort of protocol that's called, let's say, probabilistic in the sense. So here we also create photon qubit pairs in two different nodes. But here the idea is you just let the, the, the photons propagate and you basically perform a bell measurement on these photons. And you are just basically performing heralding. What basically means you just project your qubit state into, high, into an entangled state. But so problem here is it's a probabilistic protocol if you really want to scale it up and have multiple nodes basically the probability of getting your desired state it just decreases exponentially so um, in our work we explore a different route it was originally proposed by by Sirac and Barbara Kraus in the in the 2000 so here the idea is a bit different so here what they do so they use correlated photons specifically they use two mode squeeze light which is used to drive uh, qubits in different cavities in different rooms and basically they show that uh, so this the, 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 the qubit state so the long dynamics the steady state uh, dynamics of the qubit actually um, corresponds to a, to a to an entangled state in this case the ground the state excited the state combination which they show that if you just crank up the power of the source so you basically just put more squeezing strength in your system, basically this state goes into basically a, a bell state, a maximally entangled state. And starting from this, I, we just ask a, a few questions. We want to explore 
What happens? So can, how can we include finite bandwidth effects in the source? Can we actually um, include multiple qubits and see what sort of states can we generate? And for that, we just develop new numerical techniques. So um, first, let me show you but I, what I mean by this finite bandwidth effect. <clears throat> so in general, we will have a source that will emit photons and usually the source is broadly speaking it's characterized by its spectrum either be the photon number or the its correlations and it's usually it has some finite bandwidth so usually in 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 all the theoretical proposals that are up there they usually take what's called a, a markovian approximation or the broadband limit in which basically means that the qubit is uh, so the bandwidth of the qubit is really much smaller than the bandwidth of the source and then there are mathematical tricks such as basically adiabatic elimination of the of the source and so basically in in this limit um so the qubit is seeing the source at a, at a, at a single frequency but what happens in, in in experiments is that actually the the bandwidth of the of the qubit is actually much broader so uh, experimentally what happens is that the qubits actually see basically part um of the spectrum of the source but also it can happen that they see some 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 spectrum which just comes out of the source and we would like to model this we would like to see what happens and this is a the first the, the setup here i just put the master question just for completeness but it's not necessary but so how we model this so um basically the source is just a nonlinear hamiltonian which basically is what it means so we are producing pairs of photons in mode A and B. They are correlated. These photons couple to a waveguide, and then they just couple to different to different qubits. Here it's important to state that this cascade, so this interaction is cascaded or unidirectional. So it means that all the photons from the source go directly to the qubits, but there is no 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 feedback to the to the source. This is usually achieved with circulators. I have not drawn them here, but those are basically noisy or just so there are some elements which uh, they can induce some loss. I will talk about it later on. And it basically means that, yeah, so basically all the photons from the source, they just go di directly to the to the qubits. Um, so uh, first, let, let me show you um, so what, what we get. So what happens if we take two qubits and we drive them with uh, with correlated photons? So first of all, uh, we can show that we recover the result from the original proposal in this in this limit, or this basically this Markovian limit or this broadband limit. But then we actually plot here. So this is the concurrence. So this is basically a measurement on the entanglement between the two qubits. I, we plot it for different pump strength here, but this is basically another measure of the squeezing strength, how much is, uh, uh, so basically how much power you have in or how much photon you have in your system for different bandwidth ratios so first of all we actually see that uh, this limit this um the limit of achieving a maximal entanglement state uh basically a bell pair is only achieved asymptotically when both uh, the finite bandwidth and the pump strength go to infinity in more realistic experiments now uh, we are working i have in mind super um Superconducting technologies actually this beta is between 10 and 100 so it actually means that in this system the more you pump actually you cannot achieve a perfectly bell state you actually uh, so basically you can find an optimal squeezing uh, strength such that you can i mean you're going to still extract some entanglement in, in your system um but it is not uh, op as optimal as what as one would have um, modeled before. And so before I, I mentioned that um, if you have a physical link, the efficiency, if you lose more than 50% of your photons, it is not possible to create uh, entanglement. And moreover, I said that we are using circulators, which are objects that basically they induce a bit of photon losses. But here we actually show that this protocol works even if we lose more than 50% of the photons, um so basically even so basically the, the we can still extract some entanglement as long as we are sending even an infinite amount of of photons um so 
Now we ask a, a following question. So what happens if we just put another um, photon pairs? So here again, I assume that between the two qubits in, the, in this waveguide, I have some circulator or some element which makes it unidirectional. So in general, this waveguide is unidirectional. So everything from the left just flies to the right. And so let me go through what, uh, what exactly what, what happens here. So we are driving these four qubits with correlated photons. So probably it's uh, unexpected that, okay, once you drive this uh, first system, you will get a, a, a basically a, a, an entangled state as I showed you before. But so what happens is, so once you have created this entangled state, this is a dark state of the system. What it means is that it basically decouples from the environment so the following photons, they don't see it as bell pair. So pair, the, therefore, it is at this pair with not there. So the, the, the photons are just going through and driving the second pair of qubits. So basically what we see is that we are able to create two parallel um, entangled states. Um, moreover, interestingly enough, this also works if we have some detuning in the system, because uh, I forgot to mention that up until now we were in resonance. So as, as long as the detuning are the same with, in basically the same magnitude with opposite sign, but then this raises the questions, what happens if we play with the tuning and we actually consider that this qubit has the same detuning as the diagonal term and vice versa. And we assume, for example, that they are largely detuned. So what one finds out that actually now we are able to create bell pairs between diagonally distributed qubits and then, of course, the uh, probably now it's uh, a bit um, unexpected. What happens if both qubits still keeping this uh, diagonal configuration of the detunings? But what happens if both the tunings are actually quite similar? So what will actually happen is that the the, the final state of the system is actually a multi-qubit state. It is actually a linear combination of having the both. Um, of having parallel and diagonal entangled pairs. <clears throat> and so uh, now this is for four, uh, for four qubits. So the question is, can we actually generalize it to multiple qubits? So the answer is yes. So probably it comes, it's not surprising now that if we add a third pair that we will create this, um, this ladder of, of entangled states. And this could go ad infinitum in principle. And this is easy to characterize. So this state is just the product state of bell pairs. But uh, one could ask, so what happens if in general we have some random the tuning, the tuning pattern? Is there actually some trivial way we can characterize these states? And uh, we actually found out a, a recipe on how to, how to basically properly characterize these states. So the idea is we, from the initial state, this parallel state, we just perform some swap operation on the detunings, which is just applying some unitary on these on this two basically um, qubits. Then from this four, we actually realize that actually having the, 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 the tuning swap, it means basically crossing the, the entanglement. And this new state is nothing else than the previous state times this unitary transformation. Then uh, probably now you can already see it, but to go from this state to this is just another swap operation. So basically, if we want to characterize this state, in this case, it is just the original state, this product state of bell pairs times these two swap operators, and the angles, they just depend on the, the tunings you have just swapped. Um, so this is uh, what we, we, I mean, we can extend it in general. Uh, so basically, what uh, the message I, I want to say is, so um, it is easy to characterize these entangled states, which are basically the product of bell pairs. But in general, if you have any more combination, a more difficult combination of a state, it is only about keeping track of what are the necessary permutations, the swap operations, to go from one the tuning pattern to the other the tuning pattern. Um, I have not mentioned, but so these swap operators, they actually need to be between neighboring operators. So basically to go from here to here, it's just applying four unitary operations. Uh, but 
Also, uh, we've seen before that it is not about just the order, but it is also now also about the, the, the strength of these tunings. Why I mean, why I say that is that if the qubits are really the tune to, between each other, we can just create um, entangled pairs a la carte throughout these uh, waveguides. However, if we if we basically just um, use the, the tunings such that they are really close to each other, we can just create a much rich uh, um, multi qubit states, and this is the part of so the original title I have already written programmable. This is where it comes from. And it's programmable in the sense that just by choosing an external parameter, it does in this case basically the detuning pattern and the detuning intensity, one can just generate the, the states one basically uh, desire, either be this multi qubit state or this bipartite states. <clears throat> um, However, and I'm almost done, um, I have, for these results, I have assumed that I'm still in this broadband limit, which theoretically, I would be able to create an, create an infinite amount of Bell pairs, but this is not what uh, happens experimentally. So we ask the question, so if we are actually to model this in a realistic setup, would the entanglement decay along this waveguide? So to do that, we actually have to simulate the, basically the full system again. So we have to simulate this bosonic modes and the whole qubits. And this is actually a quite difficult task. So we just develop some numerical methods. So the idea is to transform these bosonic modes into complex variable, um, stochastic variables. This basically is called a positive P representation. And this is, uh, I mean, with this, we are able to simulate uh, basically the, the system. I show it here just for three qubits, just for completeness. But I show, I basically show that for really finite bandwidth, something experimentally, what's, what we have right now, um, while we are not able to create uh, perfect bell pairs, what I can show is that, um, so the entanglement propagates along the network without decaying. So in principle, one should be able to create uh, a ladder of bell pairs throughout the network. It would still require uh, infinite amount of time to create an infinite amount of qubits, but they would just propagate throughout the throughout the network. And just to wrap it up, so I just provided a really detailed analysis on this continuous to discrete uh, variable protocols. I have shown how even in the presence of imperfection, you can still extract some entanglement. I have shown how just by changing or playing with the tuning, one can create bipartite or multi-qubit states and how this state, even in the case of finite bandwidth, they still survive in a, in a realistic network. And I would be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yes, questions, please. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Very nice results. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I guess you, very naively, it might not be surprising that it takes infinite amount of time to create infinite amount of entanglement in uh, yeah. Yeah, in this ID, but the, sorry, yeah. geometry. So yeah. the question is, do you have a sense of how the time scales as the number, as the size of the system goes up? Is yeah. it a linear scaling? Yeah, yeah. so it, it is actually a good question because it highly depends on the amount of pump power you have in your system. So um, in a way, this is only true if we keep ourselves in, you know, let's say, in a long, really small squeezing in the system. If we actually crank up the power and we say, actually, I want to create bell pairs. Mm -hmm. What happens is I will have a lot of, so the first qubit will probably really reach a highly entangled state, but then the entanglement really decays along the waveguide. So this is still preliminary analysis. We still don't know if it decays linearly or exponentially. I think it's an important question. Uh, but for this case, a uh, really um, small uh, palm power, it's actually linear with the number of qubits. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, 
I have a, a possibly naive question. I mean, so it, actually it wasn't clear to me if the connection between the number of entangled photon pairs you send. And uh, so in the in this case, you have three qubit pairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and uh, so do you need three entangled pairs or you can, I mean, that doesn't seem to ah. be the case from what you have said. I mean, no. so. Okay, yeah. I, I totally understand your, your so it's it's a bit probably difficult to understand because here it's something which continuous variable you are just actually sending a lot of photons mm. how can you actually create something which is actually discrete variable here mm. um i always have this knife picture in mind um so uh the i mean the state we are creating is a superposition of the ground state and the excited state so i always think so we start with the cute in the ground state and we are pump, constantly pumping them with photons. So what, because everything is symmetric between the two wave cards. So I basically, I'm, I'm always exciting, but I have, so this is a driven dissipative system. So it decays, so it, it will, they will decay, mm. but because there are always photons in the system, which are correlated, I'm going to excite them again. Okay. And basically yeah. the cycle okay. around the exact state. So there's sort of equilibrium where you yeah, have them in exactly. the Exactly. I understand. Okay. Exactly. You're yeah. completely right. Okay, then, then it's clear. Yes. Yes. Everything is basically steady state solution. It reaches an equilibrium. Mm. Yes. Yes. Anything else? Okay. Then I think we'll are at the last uh, talk, and we'll turn to um, yeah. Finland. Alto. Yes. Or, or I don't know. It's a combination of the university and University of Helsinki. Uh, yes, both of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is Dr. Bayan Karimi, uh, and the talk is ultra-sensitive calorimetric detection in superconducting quantum circuits. Please. Yeah. Share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Now? Yeah, thank you. So um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. So the main goal of this talk uh, is to present our efforts towards uh, um, detecting calorimetric detection of uh, small energies. So uh, let me start by the um, simple principle of the calorimetry that's how it works. So the main body in the calorimeter is just the absorber um, with the heat, small heat capacity C and then temperature T. We, here we have, a, for example, normal metal absorber. And then this absorber is coupled uh, via thermal conductance to the some bath with the fixed temperature T0. So uh, in the beginning, they are in equilibrium. And then if this absorber is exposed to a small energy, then the temperature will rise uh, with the E of a C, and then if nothing else happens, the temperature turn back uh, exponentially with the time constant C of a G thermal. So the, uh, this uh, principle is already, already known for decades, let's say, for example, for the X-ray, but now the main idea is just to uh, try to use this method for detecting microwave photons, which the energy is like a 10 to 8 times smaller than uh, the expected ones that it's uh, observed. So it's a very challenging thing. So for the energy resolution of such a detectors, we need to have a take care of a three parameters here. So the heat capacity should be as low as possible, and then it should be a weak coupling to the uh, phonon bus. And then the main uh, things here is just about the uh, how uh, sensitive to the noise of the temperature because of the detecting temperature. So the SD is the main parameter here. So now, uh, let's say for measuring the electronic temperature, one of the traditional way for measuring the electronic temperature is to use the uh, um, NIS tunnel junctions where we have a superconductor, normal metal, and uh, uh, insulator in between. And then in order to measure this fast, 
So we embed these uh, NIS tunnel junctions into such a circuit like uh, this LC circuit. And the main idea is just by doing the RF measurement by putting the input and output signal here. We, uh, this um, absorber here, let's say, the um, conductance of this one will change with respect to the uh, input signal. So then the mm -hmm. um, conductance of that, which is this S21, which is proportional to the uh, conductance of the absorber, uh, it will be a temperature dependence, as one can see here. But the uh, idea is just here, it loses the sensitivity uh, at the low temperature, which is not good. So for this, we had to um, develop our uh, new type of the detectors, which is proximitized uh, uh, this normal uh, NIS junction, where we use still use the same uh, principle of this NIS tunnel junction, but we add this uh, superconductor uh, directly uh, to the uh, normal metal. So the idea is just now this um, uh, superconductor induce some proximity effect to this normal metal. And then if this is, for example, if it's far away from the tunnel junction, still we have the same feature. But if we make this one closer and closer to the tunnel junctions, so we see that there will be some anomaly appeared around zero. So the good thing is just, first of all, this anomaly where it appeared, it, it happens at the zero. Uh, bias, it means that it's non-invasive. And another important feature about this uh, is that it starts to be very sensitive at lower temperature. For example, here down to 20, but recently we measured down to 10 millikelvin, still we have a sensitivity. So it means that now we have a sensitive thermometer, which is non-invasive, operate at zero, temp uh, at zero bias, and then it's sensitive towards the lower temperature in these kind of setups. So now the idea is just how much this, uh, this detector that we have uh, is sensitive to, um, for example, for the SD, for the noise temperature. So let's say when we have this uh, absorber here, which is, uh, uh, sorry, which is coupled to the phonon bus. So based on the fluctuation dissipation theorem, so the noise uh, of the spectral density of noise, heat current noise, is proportional to the thermal conductance because we uh, it is coupled to the phonon bus of, uh, via this energy. So it is similar to the fluctuation dissipation theorem for the current, but here it is proportional to T squared because uh, we are talking about the energy. And then if we divided this uh, heat current uh, noise by the G thermal squared, then we can obtain this spectral uh, density of the temperature uh, at the low frequency. So this is an important parameters that determine the sensitivity of the uh, our detector, which is called the noise equivalent temperature. So the idea is just now we are just measuring the, this temperature with this detector that I said very fast. So it is the RMS uh, of this detector divided by the bandwidth of the measure, me, measuring uh, sampling rate that we are measuring. So the real data, something look like this, although the main temperature uh, is uh, constant, but since it is coupled to the phonon bus, so we see such kind of fluctuations. And practically, these fluctuations tells us how our uh, detector is sensitive to the external noise here. So this is the data for the experimental data that uh, one can see here. So the, how uh, how it behaves at the uh, equilibrium thermal uh, noise equivalent temperature here. Uh, um, at the different temperatures. So we can see that, for example, at the higher temperature, we see some expectation of one over T, uh, which is given by the simple, like an electron phonon coupling. But then we had at the some temperature, we saw some turnover, uh, which decreased the temperature. So it means that this uh, G thermal, we have also other channels, which our detector can be connected to, like a connecting to the photons or tunneling uh, effect when we uh, the diff this noise equivalent temperature uh, can behave differently, like a square root of T instead of one over T. So what all this means, it means that if we collect this few of this experimental data, which is like a, in equilibrium, and put it into such frames, it means that we there is a bound which based on the 
fluctuation dissipation theorem for the electron phonon coupling, it is prohibited region. So it means that no one can reach, uh, can go to this regime. So when this uh, means that uh, our data is close to this lower bound, it means that our detector is calm enough for receiving the, the data, so or the quanta and uh, this energetic quanta. So if we expect that with the uh, energy, the quanta that is coming to the absorber, it has like a one Kelvin energy, which is close to the like a 20 uh, gigahertz uh, of a photon. If it comes, we have like a uh, like a range that uh, we are expecting that we will, we will be able to see the signal. Actually, in this case, our signal to noise ratio will be something like 10. So it means that we have our detector. So then, for example, here we can see the simulation of this detector, so which is based on the electron phonon coupling. And then if we uh, apply this, uh, for example, uh, releasing energy from a qubit to this, so we have like a um, one Kelvin here. So we have like a, um, a signal to noise ratio 10 that one can uh, see here, and then it can be very visible. So now uh, we are in the uh, stage that we are, um, let's say, um, try to uh, see that how our detector works in the real setup. So here we have like a, uh, our detector coupled to the coplanar wave resonators, and then we are mimicking the same situation by uh, sending the pi pulses, as uh, so let's say some uh, heat pulses to the to these coplanar uh, wave resonators. And then we want to see that how the um, relaxation, energy relaxation or uh, temperature relaxation, how it happens into this uh, absorber where the, where the detector is. So uh, we can see here, so uh, when we, uh, for example, at uh, time one millisecond, when we apply the, um, uh, the pulse, so, and then we have a duration of like a hundred uh, microsecond. And then when everything switch off, so uh, this is the energy, re uh, the relaxation temperature for the uh, absorber at different temperature. And this uh, is up, um, like a, close to the uh, exponential decay. It means that we have like a quite like a mi hundred uh, micro second time uh, to be able to detect such kind of uh, energy, which is quite a, a lot of time in a sense. So it means that this is also in this respect, we have a, a clear window that it, we will be able to see such kind of effect. But now, uh, since uh, we have a, also an, a theoretical uh, proposal to uh, ha if uh, for example, uh, based of the experimental setup, it will be difficult to detect such kind of uh, uh, quanta. We uh, try to propose that it can be possible that when the energy, for example, releases from this qubit to the uh, to two twin uh, absorber and uh, put the uh, detector, uh, twin uh, detector on this uh, let's say twin absorbers, where we detect the signal uh, simultaneously. And by doing the cross correlation measurement with these two detector, the signal to noise uh, can enhance dramatically. And then we can boost the sensitivity. For example, here uh, with what, uh, with let's say one Kelvin uh, quanta and then quite fast, it is possible already with one signal to see it, but when uh, the, uh, it is more challenging, um, to, for example, much smaller energy like a 0 0.3 Kelvin, and then with the slower um, energy uh, with the slower thermometer. So we can see that the only way that is um, possible to detect such kind of uh, uh, quanta is only with the cross correlation technique. So uh, this is the uh, um, setup that at the moment that we have here. So here we have a, a transmon type qubit, which is uh, coupled capacitively to our coplanar wave resonators. And then at the end, we have our uh, detector. This is a preliminary, um, uh, this is a preliminary uh, experiment that we are done here. So we are just uh, sending like a continuous wave to this uh, coplanar, uh, to this qubit. And then we can see that the, how the spectra of the qubit looks like. We have a 
uh, avoided crossing here. So it means that we have a uh, coupling between the qubit and then the resonators. So it means that at this range, the channel is open. So we are sending quite a lot of photons at the same time because it's like a continuous wave. And then here the um, spectra from the, our uh, detector. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's quite, it was really for us, it's like impressive that it was the first time that we see this, some like a temperature signature of this, uh, uh, of these incoming uh, photons to, uh, to it. Uh, but uh, based on the setups that we have, we receive only a quite a portion of the um, uh, power that we are sending. So uh, in the future, we try to uh, increase the, uh, for example, the uh, coupling to the qubit. And then we, we, uh, these uh, temperature changes can be uh, even more sensitive to the receiving uh, data. And then uh, the last part is just uh, um, how, which, um, how much um, the question that it, we were asked is that how, uh, how is possible um, that or how much is possible the energy that releases from the Josephson junction or just let's say so-called qubit can be absorbed by the, uh, this absorber that we have for the normal metal. So let's say when we uh, apply like a... Um, voltage bias or like uh, our, our uh, Josephson current here. So we have a, like a um, Josephson junction SIS and then we couple to two of our uh, absorber where we are measuring the um, static uh, temperature, steady state tem measurement of this uh, absorber at the two end. So in this case, when we are applying a bias or let's say current to this Josephson junction, so uh, we based on the changing of the phase slip, so there will be a, a two pi of a phase slip and then the dissipation, uh, we try to see that how much is uh, possible to be uh, received into this uh, absorber here. So this is the um, experimental data where uh, we see that uh, while we, we have a, a energy release from this Josephson junction. So this is the temperature measurement of these two absorber uh, at the same time. So we can see that the, how the IV of these uh, Josephson junctions look like, but then how the tem profile of the temperature uh, seen can be seen here. So we saw some quite a uh, few different regimes where, for example, at the uh, low um, bias regime where we have a, this is just because of the uh, joule heating of the, um, the, the resistor. But the interesting thing is just here, um, we, we can see that in the range of like a, below the plasma frequency, uh, we see some um, uh, uh, that almost 100% based on the calculations that we had, 100% of the energy releases from this, um, for the AC uh, current of these Josephson junctions converted to heat here and then can be absorbed uh, by, the, um, by the two detector on the both sides. And then we can see that above this plasma frequency, actually uh, nothing goes through the absorbers. And then we can see that the um, temperature reaches again to the base temperature, but then again, above this two delta gap, we will go to this quasi particles branch when everything that heats up. So in a case, uh, if the energy release from this um, let's say Josephson junctions or qubit, it can be really go to the uh, absorber which is attached and then um, can be detected by the, um, by the detectors that we can um, present it here. So with this, uh, I would like to just thank our group. So mainly it was experimental done at uh, Alto. So with my professor, uh, supervisor, Professor Yuka Pekola, and then the, uh, the uh, Kwanshun Chiang and Jay Yan for the experimental of the uh, detectors, and then both groups that I'm working at the moment, PICO and Heltec in University of Helsinki. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> we have we have mostly been working in the or most talks have been in the optical region, but now we are definitely in the solid state region. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so questions, please. I will ask something. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, I'm also in the optics region, so you have to okay. bear <laughs> with me. So I noticed at uh, um, when you um, you discussed at some point when the pulses you sent in, and yeah. they had, uh, as I understood, different uh, different uh, in intensity i would say or possibly energy but anyway you said it was pi pulses but then you also said it was heat pulses and so i didn't quite un and on that graph you had i mean you had a flat line and then you had the decay for different kinds of input so for uh you mean for this uh for uh, this part so yes he, exactly this, this is yeah. just uh, exactly sending uh, through the um, pulse generating so we are just sending these pulses so through the pump line so mm -hmm. here for example through this pump line we are sending uh, these um, these pulses so um this is like a we are uh, this is um, um, it looks like, for example, if we are we have a qubit, it looks like a pi pulses that all the time we are just generating at the, uh, let's say to to be the qubit in the excited state. So it's just uh, mimicking things. So mm. it's like a square wave, uh, let's say, function that um, we are just putting it in many of them at the same time, and then we are just sending it. So it's just mimicking. Okay, the, uh, so you're repeated. you yeah, repeatedly. Actually, the result that it can be shown here is like a, a averaging of like a thousands for this experiment here, yeah. thousands of these uh, generating these boxes that it comes. And then uh, this is, uh, let's say uh, we are exciting everything. It looks like a, it comes unconverted, this energy. Uh, when it comes to the absorber, it changed to the temperature. And then we see this as a temperature profile. That's why we are saying that, okay, it's like a heat pulse because uh, it changed the temperature uh, of the absorber will rise and then we see only the uh, relaxing back of the temperature from the absorber when it's coupled to the phonon bus. Yes. I mean, I'm looking at the lines in the beginning, I mean, between one and 1.1 millisecond. Yes. So is, is this related to how long you run this sequence or? Yes, exactly. It's just, it's okay. me that you are just keeping yes. for a okay then i see and then you as you run longer actually you have exactly. a problem. and then let's yeah. say at 1.1 millisecond yeah. we switch off everything yeah. and then we see that already the temperature rised in our detector and then we just see that what is the uh, let's say temperature less mm -hmm. time constant of mm -hmm. the uh, because we will see this pulse, how it comes back, the time constant of the absorber. And then if it's long enough, it means that we have such enough time uh, to see this data. Or if it's just drop quickly, it means that we don't have time to detect any of these uh, quanta. So, mm. and then this 100 microseconds about, for example, at the lower temperature, we can see that at higher temperature, we almost lose our chance. Mm. But at mm. lower temperature, it means that it's long enough. It means that mm. the detector can still uh, see this um, energy if it comes. That's why yep. when we saw this, then we added this uh, qubit uh, for the next stage. Yeah. And this case, when you use two detectors to 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 mm -hmm. look at the correlation of the signal. Yes. Uh, I mean, is that to eliminate noise so so that you because if you look for correlations because noise is uncorrelated or that has nothing to do with that yeah uh, okay let's say that now we uh, there are two important uh, source for the noise here mm. so first of all we have uh, because we have like a electronic setups for the so we have a, like a one channel that we always call it as a background noise, which is from the instrumental noise. This we have, and then uh, it's very, for example, there are some ways to uh, subtract this noise. But then another uh, noise is just like a inherent noise because of the absorber is coupled to the phonon bus. And then we have this energy exchange between that. And then this is uh, really difficult to uh, subtract these two. So, but then, uh, if we, for example, try to tune uh, these two bus in a way that they are totally, let's say, uh, they have uncorrelated uh, noise, 
for example, they are far enough from each other that they have uncorrelated noise that they are talking to the bass. And then we have two different channels uh, that for sure these are also, they have the uncorrelated noise. So then that's why probably from one, uh, uh, one side, it will be difficult because we have, we cannot get rid of at least one of these noises, which is the, um, let's say, electron phonon coupling mm -hmm. noise. But then since they are uncorrelated, that's why the cross correlation can help us to just uh, try to get rid of this background noise and then uncorrelated noise. That's why the, we can see that here for the very slow, detector and very challenging energy, which is very small, mm. still, uh, the signal will revive. And then one would be possible to the, to see the signal with this technique. Yes, also, I know to the, the title Yocto calor Calorimetry. Yes, from Michael, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So this is, uh, okay, it needs to be seen, actually. This is uh, one, one, uh, things that we'd really like to test it experimentally also here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a any, lot. Any other question? Mm -hmm. I think uh, then I would like to thank everyone. I, I think it's been uh, really interesting to, li to listening to the talk and uh, I hope the rest of you think the same. Uh, I wish you a nice evening, those that are in uh, in Europe, and um, and a nice day for uh, those that are in the US. So, bye for now. Thank you.